Name of the Book Second Chance for Your Money, Your Life, and Our World by Robert Kiyosaki, Part 1, The Past, Introduction, I was in a Starbucks the other day and ran into a friend I had not seen in years. Although happy to see him, I was surprised to find him working behind the counter. How long have you worked here? I asked. About five months, he replied as he took my order. What happened? I asked. Well, after the market crashed in 2007, I lost my job. I found another one, but that job soon disappeared, too. Finally, after burning through our retirement and savings, we lost our house. We just couldn't hang on. He continued, don't worry. We've been working. We're not unemployed. We both have jobs, but we're not making much money. So I work here, at Starbucks, to make a few bucks. Get it, I work for bucks at Starbucks. He said, laughing out loud. Stepping aside so the customers behind me could place their orders, I asked, so what are you doing for your future? I'm back in school. I'm getting another master's degree. It's kind of fun being in school again. I even take a few classes with my son. He's earning his first master's degree. Paid for with student loans. I asked. Yeah. What else can we do? I know they're terrible loans. I know I'll be working for the rest of my life, just to pay off my loan. My son has more time to pay off his. But we all need more education if we want high-paying jobs. We have to make money. We need to earn a living. So we're in school. I paid for my coffee and was handed a steaming cup. When I offered him a tip, he refused, and I know why he refused. So I wished him luck, and walked out the door. Part 1 of this book is about the past. More specifically, how we got into this global financial crisis. As George Orwell wrote in his book 1984, in a time of universal deceit, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. Chapter 1 Why the rich don't work for money, according to our Buckminster Fuller, they're playing games with money. Our wealth is stolen via the money we work for. Rich Dad Poor Dad was self-published in 1997. It had to be a self-published book because every major publisher we pitched it to turned it down. A few publishers commented, you don't know what you are talking about. Some of the points they objected to were my rich dad's statements such as, 1. Your house is not an asset. 2. Savers are losers. 3. The rich don't work for money. 10 years later, in 2007, the subprime mortgage crisis hit and millions of homeowners found out firsthand that their house is not an asset. In 2008, the US government and Federal Reserve Bank began printing trillions of dollars, causing millions of savers to be losers via the loss of purchasing power due to inflation, higher taxes, and low interest rates on their savings. Rich Dad's Lesson 1 in Rich Dad Poor Dad is the rich don't work for money, and it was the least criticized of Rich Dad's three teachings on money. In this chapter, you will learn why this comment is the most important of my Rich Dad's lessons, and why it is important to understand before you consider your opportunities for a second chance, a fresh start for both your money and your life. What you need to know about money The subject of money can be complicated and intimidating. But if you start with the basics and use them as building blocks you can gain the knowledge you need to understand money and investing and how to make your money work for you. The most basic thing you need to know about money is that it is a subject that you can become smarter about, a subject that can give you the confidence to make informed and educated decisions. Question, who needs a second chance? Answer, we all do. Question, why? Answer because money as we know it has changed and continues to change. Question, why is that important? Answer, because the poor will become poorer, the middle class will shrink, and the rich will get richer. Question, I think we all know that. What is different about the rich getting richer and everyone else becoming poorer? Answer, many people who are rich today will be among the new poor. Question, why will the rich become the new poor? Answer, 
there are many reasons. One reason is because many rich people measure their wealth in money. Question, what's wrong with that? Answer, the fact that money is no longer money. Question, if money is no longer money, then what is money? Answer, knowledge is the new money. Question, so if money is knowledge, you're saying that many who are poor and middle class today, have the opportunity to become the new rich of tomorrow? Answer, exactly. In the past, the rich were those who controlled land and resources such as oil, weapons, or giant corporations. Today things are different. Today we live in the information age and information is abundant and often free. Question, so why isn't everyone rich? Answer, it takes education to process information into knowledge. Without financial education, people cannot process information into personal wealth. Question, but America spends billions on education. Why are there more poor people than rich people? Answer, hundreds of billions of dollars are spent on education, but almost nothing is spent on financial education. Question, why isn't financial education taught in schools? Answer, I have been asking that question for years, ever since I was nine years old. Question, and what did you find out? Answer, I learned that knowledge is power. If you want to control people's lives, limit their knowledge. That is why, throughout history, despots have burned books and exiled, and even killed, those with knowledge who threatened their power. Before the Civil War in America, it was against the law in many states to teach slaves to read and write. Knowledge is the most powerful force on earth. That is why the control of knowledge is essential to the control of power. The formula is, information x education equals knowledge knowledge is power and lack of knowledge is weakness. My poor dad was a highly educated man with a PhD, but he had almost no financial education. He had authority within the school system, but little power in the real world. My rich dad never finished school, but he was highly educated in the world of money. Although less formally educated than my poor dad, he had more power in the real world than my poor dad. Question, so those in power maintain control of that power through the school system, through what's taught and what isn't taught. That's why there is no financial education in schools. Answer, I believe that's true. Today financial knowledge is more powerful than a gun or the whips and shackles of slavery. The lack of financial education enslaves billions of people in all parts of the world. Question, what has replaced the whips and shackles and guns? Answer, the monetary system. Question, the monetary system? Our money? How does the monetary system control people? Answer, the money system is designed to keep people poor, not to make them rich. The monetary system is designed to keep people working hard for money. Money enslaves those who are uneducated financially. Those who are financially uneducated become slaves to a paycheck. And our wealth is stolen through money, through the very thing most people work for all their lives. That is why the people who work the hardest for money, often called the working poor, continue to grow poorer, not richer, no matter how hard they work. Question. How is our wealth stolen via our money? Answer, there are many ways. You may already know some of them. They are, 1. Taxes The value of your labor is stolen via taxes. 2. Inflation prices rise when governments print money. As prices rise, people work harder, only to pay more in taxes and inflation. 3. Savings The banks steal savers wealth via a banking process known as the fractional reserve system. Let's use a fractional reserve of 10, as an example. A saver puts $1 into his or her savings account. The bank is allowed to lend $10, against that $1, to borrowers. This is another form of printing money which is not only inflationary but reduces the purchasing power of a saver's money. This is one of a number of reasons why Rich Dad often said, savers are losers. Later in this book I will explain other ways in which your money is stolen from you. As I've said, the monetary system was designed to make people poorer, not richer. 
Question, can you prove that? Answer, I will show you a graph. As the saying goes, a picture is worth a thousand words. The graph is not proof, but it does tell a story about the growth of people needing government assistance. The war on poverty in 1964, President Lyndon Johnson declared a war on poverty. Many believe we won that war. Others do not. The chart below shows the numbers of people who use food stamps, today called SNAP, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Although many believe we won the war on poverty, the increasing reliance on food stamps tells a different story. The chart of individuals receiving food stamps shows that, in 1975, approximately 17 million people received food stamps. By 2013, the number had increased to approximately 47 million people and continues to increase. Question, if the number of poor people is increasing, where are they coming from? Answer, the middle class. Many of today's poor were doing well as middle class Americans a few years ago. The war on the middle class The chart above shows what's happening to the middle class. A few years ago, TV journalist Lou Dobbs wrote a book on this middle class decline, The War on the Middle Class, How the Government, Big Business and Special Interest Groups are Waging War on the American Dream and How to Fight Back. His point, if the middle class is in decline, the United States is in decline, since the middle class is the engine of the U.S. economy. During the 2012 presidential campaign, both candidates Barack Obama and Mitt Romney promised to save the middle class. An inquiring mind might ask, why does the middle class need saving? As most of us know, if the government is promising to save you, you have already lost. Inflation steals wealth The monetary system steals our wealth through inflation. The chart below explains why the poor and middle class are struggling, regardless of how hard they work. Question, how does the monetary system cause inflation? Answer, the primary cause of inflation is the printing of money. When money is printed by banks or governments two things happen, inflation kicks in and taxes goes up. When prices and taxes go up, people struggle financially. Question, how do people survive when prices go up? Answer, when prices go up, people use their credit cards to survive. Many are forced to cut expenses, like healthier food or dental care. Many become slaves to debt. And many more become little more than indentured servants, or slaves to their paychecks. Debt slaves as middle class income declined, and taxes and prices went up, many turned to their credit cards to survive, becoming slaves to debt. The chart below tells that story. Today, taxes, debt, and inflation are the iron shackles that bind modern-day slaves. Two types of rich question, how are the rich getting richer, if the poor and middle class are growing poorer? Answer, there are two types of rich people. One type of rich is the truly rich. They are getting richer. The other type of rich is getting poorer. The chart on the next page tells that story. Question, I can see that the rich, the upper 1%, are getting richer. But what is happening to the 90 to 95%? Why is their income going down? Are those the rich that you're talking about, the rich that are growing poorer? Answer, yes. This chart tells a tale of two different types of rich people. As you can see from the chart, the real rich, the top 1% of all Americans, became extremely rich with a gain of 309% in income since 1979. Yet, the top 95-99% to 99 are losing ground. Their income is not growing. Question, is this why you said earlier about some of the rich becoming the new poor? Answer, yes. Notice the chart we just looked at only takes us to 2007. That was the year the Great Recession began. After 2007, many millionaires were wiped out in the subprime mortgage fiasco and the stock market crash. Question, so this chart would look worse today? Answer, yes. The upper 1% of Americans has gotten richer. Many of the others, the other type of rich I've described, are now poorer. 
many slid from rich to poor in less than a year. Many were wiped out when they lost their high-paying jobs, their homes, and their wealth as stock portfolios collapsed. Of the rich who survived the crash and remain in the upper 20%, many, thanks to inflation, are becoming poorer. Some have already slid into the middle class. Q, tell me again, what's the difference between the two types of rich? A, one type of rich is people with high-paying jobs, such as corporate executives, professional people such as doctors and lawyers, athletes, and movie stars. They are high-income rich. The other type of rich is the person who does not need a job to be rich. Most of these people are asset rich. The Millionaire Next Door in 1996, The Millionaire Next Door was published. It was a great book for its time. Written by Thomas J. Stanley and William D. Danko, the book described how ordinary, middle-class citizens had become millionaires. They did it without being Donald Trump, Steve Jobs, or Gordon Gekko from the movie Wall Street. They were not millionaire movie stars, rock stars, or professional athletes. They had become middle-class millionaires by having a good education, living in a modest home in an upscale neighborhood, driving sensible cars, saving money, and investing steadily in the stock market. Many were net worth millionaires, people who had become rich as a result of the rising value on their homes and retirement portfolios. They had become middle-class millionaires through inflation, by being part of the rising U.S. economy. They were living proof of the American dream. The September 11, 2001 terrorist attacks signaled the start of the new millennium and end of the American dream. The chart below shows that, since 9-11, life for the millionaire next door has not been easy. In 2000, the Nasdaq or dot-com crash triggered a series of booms and busts, shaking many millionaires next door out of the millionaire category. The foreclosure next door in 2007, when the subprime mortgage bubble burst, many millionaires next door became the foreclosure next door. Prior to 2007, housing prices had been rising steadily for years. As home prices rose, millions of homeowners began taking out home equity loans, which many used to pay off credit card debt or go on vacation. Using their homes as ATMs, they learned the hard way when they were upside down that their house is not an asset. When housing prices crashed, credit card use went down. When homeowners stopped using their credit cards, the economy slowed because the economy depends upon consumer spending and use of their credit cards. When consumers slowed their spending, retailers began to suffer, and when retailers suffer the world economy suffers. Today, in 2014, there are approximately 115 million households in the United States. Of those 115 million households, 43 million are renters and 25 million are households or families who own their homes free and clear. Of the approximately 50 million households with mortgages, it's estimated that over 24 million are underwater, which means they owe more on their home than their home is worth. As long as homeowners feel poor, the economy will suffer. The lost generation when the middle-class millionaires next door lost their jobs and their homes, and began using retirement accounts to pay the bills, there was another casualty, the children of the millionaire next door. All over the world, there is a generation of young people known as the new lost generation. They're the college and trade school and high school grads who cannot find jobs or jobs that utilize their level of education. More than income, they are losing crucial real-life work experience. Without real-life work experience in their 20s and 30s, their earning power and income in later years will suffer, which is why they're often called the lost generation. Young, educated, and in debt many of these highly educated people graduate saddled with student loan debt, quite possibly the worst of all possible debt. Unlike a car loan, home loan, or business loan, student loan debt is rarely forgiven. A student cannot declare bankruptcy and expect to be released from the loan. Student loan debt is an albatross around the neck of a student for life, accruing interest for life. Many will have problems buying a car, home, or investing for their future until their student loan debt is paid off. 
the current overhaul of the student loan programs may address these issues and challenges. Many of these young people are boomerang kids, kids who leave home, only to return to live with mom and dad. This makes many moms and dads, the sandwich generation, people who are now caring for their kids and their parents, often with three generations living under one roof. In the past, there were two different types of depressions, one the American Depression, 1929-1954, two. The German hyperinflation, 1918-1924, question, what was the difference? Answer, in very simple terms, Americans did not print money and the Germans printed money. Pictured here is what happened when Germany began printing money. Permission is granted to copy, distribute, and slash or modify this photograph only, and not other parts of this book, under the terms of one or more of the, one, new free documentation license, version 1.3, or any later version published by the Free Software Foundation, with no invariant sections, no front cover texts, and no back cover texts, a copy of the license can be found at www.gnu.org, and, 2, Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 3.0 Unported License, which can be found at https colon slash slash creativecommons.org slash licenses. The picture above shows what happens when a central bank and a government print money to pay their bills. In 1918, a German citizen could be a millionaire by having millions of German Reichmarks in savings. In less than five years, that same German millionaire was poor. Question, is the same thing happening in the United States today? Answer, yes. The following is a chart on QE, quantitative easing. Question, what does this mean? Answer, it means the United States is following the German model from the last depression. America is attempting to print its way out of financial crisis. Question, what does this mean to me? Answer, it means exactly what I stated earlier in this chapter. It means your wealth is being stolen via the money you work so hard for. As I said, the monetary system was not designed to make you rich. Money was designed as a means to steal your wealth. Look at the chart below. It shows what has happened to the purchasing power of your money. It has taken about 100 years for the dollar to lose 95% of its purchasing power. I doubt it will take another 100 years to lose the last 5%. Question, are you saying the dollar will go to zero? Answer, if the United States keeps printing money, it might. Question, but it can't happen in America, can it? Answer, it has happened a number of times. Question, when? Answer, during the Revolutionary War, President George Washington and the Congress of the United States began printing a currency known as the Continental to pay for the war. The British helped destroy the Continental by printing bogus Continentals. Soon the Continental was worth less than the paper it was printed on. During the Revolutionary War, not worth a Continental was the slogan of the war. The same thing happened to the Confederate dollar. The Confederacy printed money to pay its bills and buy weapons. In many ways, the Civil War was lost because of bad money. The US government printed the greenback to pay for the Civil War. If the North had lost, the greenback would have followed the Confederate dollar into the trash can. Today, if the US government keeps printing today's greenbacks, they, too, may be as worthless as the Continental and Confederate dollars. Question, what happens if the dollar goes to zero? Answer, it means savers will be the biggest losers and those who work for money will have lost the battle. Their wealth will be gone. I always remind myself that a German person could be a millionaire in 1918 and wiped out by 1923. And that's why lesson 1 in rich dad poor dad is the rich don't work for money. Question, if the rich don't work for money, what do the rich work for? Answer, that is what this book and most of my books and games are. Many people need a second chance to rethink about what they work for. Question, what do I need to learn? Answer, we will start with the past. Question, why the past? Answer, 
because it's from the past that we can see the future. From the past, you will learn how the rich and powerful steal our wealth via our money. In the following chapters, you will learn how the rich and powerful have ripped us off via a cash heist. If you understand how the cash heist works, you will have a better chance to make smarter choices in the present for a more prosperous and secure future. Question, will everyone have a prosperous and secure future? Answer, no, unfortunately. I'm afraid not. Question, why? Answer, because most people are still in the past. If they are stuck in the past, they will not understand Rich Dad's lesson 1. The rich don't work for money. Today, most people are too busy working for money, working hard to pay bills and save enough for the future. They will not understand lesson 1 unless they are willing to take the time to first understand the past. A second chance will do little good for people stuck in the past. As the saying goes, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. When it comes to money, many people are insane. Since we must start with the past to see the future, are you ready to move into the past? If your answer was yes please read on. Q. One last question, if money was designed to make people poor, to steal their wealth, then whom does money make rich? A. The rich, the rich who do not work for money, the rich who control the game of money. Q. How long has the game been going on? A. The game of money has been going on for as long as humans have walked the earth. Humans have always wanted to enslave others or take what others have. It's not a new game. The rich have been playing the game for a very long time. If it is your turn to learn the game of money, the game the rich play, then this is your second chance. Chapter 2 The man who could see the future most of my advances were by mistake. You uncover what is when you get rid of what isn't. R. Buckminster Fuller in the summer of 1967, a classmate and I hitchhiked from New York City to Montreal, Canada. At the time, Andy Andreessen and I were both 20-year-old students attending the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy at Kings Point, New York. We were hitchhiking to Montreal to see the future. Montreal was the site for Expo 67, the World's Fair dedicated to the future. The centerpiece of the World's Fair was the U.S. Pavilion, a massive geodesic dome that could be seen for miles. The creator of the dome was Dr. R. Buckminster Fuller, considered to be one of the greatest geniuses of our time. Dr. Fuller had a reputation as a futurist and was often called Grandfather of the Future. It seemed appropriate that the U.S. government had chosen Dr. Fuller's dome, a structure that represented the future, to be the U.S. pavilion. Dr. Fuller, or Bucky as many called him, was an enigma, he was someone who could not be defined. Harvard University claims him as one of their more prominent alums, yet Bucky did not graduate from Harvard. Although Fuller never graduated from college, he was awarded 47 honorary degrees over his lifetime. The AIA, the American Institute of Architects, consider him to be one of the world's leading architects. Bucky was not an architect by training, yet his buildings are found all over the world. In the lobby of the AIA headquarters, a bust of Fuller is prominently displayed. He is considered one of the most accomplished Americans in history, having more than 2,000 patents after his name. Fuller authored many books ranging from science and philosophy to poetry. President Ronald Reagan awarded Bucky the Presidential Freedom Medal in 1982, and he was once considered for the Nobel Prize. Although extremely accomplished, Bucky often referred to himself as a just a little guy. Poor Dad and Bucky, it was my father, the person I refer to as my poor dad, who first introduced me to Dr. Fuller. In the late 1950s, while I was still in elementary school, my dad and I would sit for hours building Bucky's models out of glue and sticks. We created the tetrahedrons, octahedrons, and icosahedrons that Fuller said were the building blocks of the universe. My poor dad and Bucky had a lot in common. Both were extremely bright men who thrived in the world of academics, especially math, science, and design. Both men were committed to a better world, a world that worked for everyone. 
both men dedicated their lives to serving humanity and world peace. In 1964, when Dr. Fuller made the cover of Time magazine, my dad was ecstatic. Standing in the future, in 1967, Andy and I, both Bucky devotees, could not wait to visit the U.S. pavilion and stand inside Fuller's massive dome. The feeling inside the dome was magical, a surreal environment of peace and possibilities. I never dreamed that one day I would actually study with the grandfather of the future. In 1981, I was invited to spend a week studying with Dr. Fuller at a lodge outside of Lake Tahoe, California. The title of the conference was The Future of Business. It was a week that forever changed the direction of my life. I wish I could say I attended the lecture series to learn more about world peace, math, science, design, generalized principles, or philosophy. I can't. My primary reason for attending the conference was to learn how Fuller could predict the future. I was motivated by pure greed, not world peace. I wanted to learn how to predict the future so I could use that knowledge to make more money. On the last day of the event something happened to me. I wish I could explain it, but my limited vocabulary makes it hard for me to describe the experience. I was standing behind the video camera and tripod, working as a volunteer and taping the entire event. I volunteered to stand behind the camera because I was falling asleep as a participant in the audience. Fuller was not an especially dynamic speaker. In fact, I would say he was boring he mumbled and used words I didn't understand. Just as the event was coming to a close, I looked up from the eyepiece of the camera, directly at Bucky, and a gentle a wave of energy went through me. I could feel my heart open and I began to cry. They weren't tears of sadness or pain, but tears of gratitude for this man's courage to do what he had been doing for years, guiding and teaching and looking into the future. John Denver wrote and recorded a song dedicated to Dr. Fuller, after Bucky touched and inspired John's life. The title of the song is What One Man Can Do. John Denver's tribute to Bucky Fuller in that song does a far better job of describing the experience I had that day with Bucky than I can do with words in this book. The words in John Denver's song that have always moved me are these, it's hard to tell the truth when no one wants to listen when no one really cares what's going on and it's hard to stand alone when you need someone beside you your spirit and your faith they must be strong followed by the refrain. What one man can do is dream what one man can do is love what one man can do is change the world and make it young again here you see what one man can do since this book is about second chances, I describe that event with Bucky Fuller because it was one of the many second chances I have had in my life. I returned to Honolulu a changed person. At that time, in 1981, I had factories in Taiwan, Korea and Hawaii that manufactured licensed products for the rock and roll industry. My company was producing products for the rock bands Pink Floyd, Duran Duran, Judas Priest, Van Halen, Boy George, Ted Nugent, REO Speedwagon, and The Police. I loved the business. My factories rolled out hats, wallets, and bags with faces and logos of the band silk screened on the products. On the weekends I would be at concerts watching my products being scooped up by raving, happy fans. It was a great business. I was single, living on the beach in Waikiki with neighbors like Tom Selleck, and making a lot of money, which used to make me happy. The problem was that Fuller had touched my heart and I knew, in my heart, that my days of sex, drugs, rock and roll, and money were coming to an end. I kept asking myself, what can I do to make the world a better place? And what am I doing with my life? In 1981, I was 34 years old. I now had three professions. I had gone to the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy in New York, received my Bachelor of Science degree, and a third mate's license to sail on oil tankers. I had gone to U.S. Navy flight school and learned how to fly professionally. I briefly considered flying for the airlines, but when I returned from Vietnam, I knew that, although I loved flying, my days as a pilot were over. I was now an entrepreneur with a global manufacturing and distribution business. 
my rock and roll products were in national chains like J.C. Penney, Tower Records, and Spencer's Gift Stores, at concerts with the bands, and offered by retailers in countries around the world through worldwide distributors. My problem was I had met Bucky Fuller. And when I returned to my factory in Honolulu, my mind would drift back to what I had experienced in Montreal. As I've said, standing in the magical environment of that dome, never dreaming I would ever meet the man who designed it, then meeting him and knowing that my life was changing yet again. My spiritual job, rather than listen to rock and roll music, I was now listening to John Denver's music. Whenever I listened to John sing What One Man Can Do the song he dedicated to Fuller, I would ask myself over and over again, what am I supposed to be doing with my life? Whenever I listened to rock and roll music, the only thing it inspired me to do was to go to the nightclubs of Waikiki. When I listened to John Denver's songs, my thinking started in my heart. Rather than stay out late in nightclubs, I spent more time alone, surfing or hiking just being with the beauty of nature. On weekends, I spent time in personal development workshops learning how to become a better person, emotionally and spiritually. My more gentle side raised a few eyebrows among my Marine Corps friends and I found myself spending more time with business groups focused on solving social problems in communities around town than with associates in rock and roll or retailing. Slowly it dawned on me that we go to school with the hope of finding a financial profession known as a job. After meeting Fuller, I realized I was looking for my spiritual profession, my spiritual work, my spiritual job and my life's purpose. From 1981 to 1983, I studied with Dr. Fuller on three different occasions during the summers. Between summers, my new friends and I would get together to group study Fuller's books. His books are not very easy to comprehend, so we would agree to study a chapter each week then get together at one of our houses to discuss and mind map Fuller's thoughts in that chapter. Mind mapping is a method of using color and sketches, rather than words, to organize and prioritize Fuller's thoughts in the chapter. The sketches were done on large sheets of flip chart paper and started with a core or central concept. The key to mind mapping is color and sketches, using very, very, few words. Using very few words forces the participant to put words and thoughts into pictures, which intensifies the learning and discussion process. As we all know, two or more minds are better than one, except in school, where two or more minds working together is known as cheating. The group study using discussion, color, and pictures was exciting, stimulating, challenging, and never boring. Rather than late nights in nightclubs, I was now spending late nights in book study groups. I knew this was my second chance to find my life's purpose. Rather than go to school to learn how to transport oil, or go to school to learn to rain terror from the skies, or go to school to learn how to manufacture and sell more rock and roll products, I was now in school, a new second chance school, learning how to be a better human being, learning possibly to be a person who might make a difference in the world. The problem was, I had no idea then what my spiritual job was, or was to be. From 1981 to 1983, I dedicated a lot of time studying Fuller's work. And 1983 was the last summer of events that I spent with him. He closed the conference with the words goodbye darling people. See you next summer. But he didn't see us the following summer. He died three weeks later on July 1, 1983. Changes on the horizon by 1984, I knew I had to make changes, the problem was I was not sure what I was supposed to do, so I just decided to do something. As the saying goes, sometimes you have to let go of what you love doing so you can do what you are supposed to do. I had also reread the book Jonathan Livingston Seagull, written by Richard Bach and first published in 1970. The following is from Wikipedia, and gives you an idea of what the book is about. The book tells the story of Jonathan Livingston Seagull, a seagull who is bored with the daily squabbles over food. Seized by a passion for flight, he pushes himself, learning everything he can about flying, until finally his unwillingness to conform results in his expulsion from his flock. An outcast, he continues to learn, 
becoming increasingly pleased with his abilities as he leads a peaceful and happy life. One day, Jonathan is met by two gulls who take him to a higher plane of existence in that there is no heaven but a better world found through perfection of knowledge, where he meets other gulls who love to fly. He discovers that his sheer tenacity and desire to learn makes him pretty well a one in a million bird. In this new place, Jonathan befriends the wisest gull, Chang, who takes him beyond his previous learning, teaching him how to move instantaneously to anywhere else in the universe. The secret, Chang says, is to begin by knowing that you have already arrived. Not satisfied with his new life, Jonathan returns to Earth to find others like him, to bring them his learning and to spread his love for flight. His mission is successful, gathering around him others who have been outlawed for not conforming. Ultimately, the very first of his students, Fletcher Lynn Seagull, becomes a teacher in his own right and Jonathan leaves to teach other flocks. Leaps of Faith One important lesson I got from Jonathan Livingston Seagull is that sometimes a person needs to let go and let the currents of life carry them to where they are supposed to go. From the summer of 1983 to end of 1984, I began preparing to let go and let the currents of life take me. That process began with informing my two partners in my rock and roll business that I was letting go and moving on. When they asked where I was going, I mumbled something about letting the currents of life carry me. When that went over their heads, I simply said, I'm taking a leap of faith into the unknown and, in October of 1983, we began the buyout process that would transition me out of the business. In January of 1984, as I was tying up loose ends in Hawaii, New York, Taiwan, and Korea, I met the most beautiful woman I had ever seen. Her name was Kim and she wanted nothing to do with me. For the next six months, I kept asking her out and for six months her answer was always the same, no. Finally, she agreed to go out. We spent dinner and a long walk on Waikiki Beach together, talking until the sun came up. From late that night until early the next morning I talked about Bucky Fuller and the possibility of a life's purpose, a person's spiritual job. She was the first woman I had ever met who was interested in these subjects. Over the next few months, we saw each other regularly. She was part of my letting go process. She was with me when I said a tearful goodbye to my partners and the workers in the Honolulu factory. Kim and I knew we, too, would soon be saying goodbye. She had her career in advertising in Honolulu and I was leaping into nothing. One day, as the day of reckoning approached, Kim said, I want to go with you. In December of 1984, Kim and I held hands and took our leap of faith into the unknown. Without a doubt, 1985 was the worst year of our lives. Little did we know that, unfortunately, there would be years ahead that would make 1985 look easy by comparison. We wish we could say it has all been easy, all peaches and cream. But it's been hell. Even today, in 2014, although financially and professionally successful we still have to deal with life in the real world, a world of greed, lies, dishonesty, legal hassles, and crime. In spite of the hardships and heartbreak, the journey has been very much like the book Jonathan Livingston Seagull described. It has been a process to test our spirit and our dedication to our process, to see if we would quit when the going got too tough. The great news is that we have met many great people, different types of people we might never have met if Kim had remained with the ad agency and I had remained in manufacturing. Wikipedia best describes the people we meet and befriend along the way, in its summary of part 2 of Jonathan Livingston Seagull, Jonathan transcends into a society where all the gulls enjoy flying. He is only capable of this after practicing hard alone for a long time. The learning process, linking the highly experienced teacher and the diligent student, is raised into almost sacred levels. They, regardless of the all immense difference, are sharing something of great importance that can bind them together, you've got to understand that a seagull is an unlimited idea of freedom, an image of the great gull. He realizes that you have to be true to yourself, you have the freedom to be yourself, your true self, here and now, and nothing can stand in your way. 
There were many times in 1985 when Kim and I had no place to live and no money to eat. We survived by living in an old, brown Toyota and in a friend's basement. As I said, our faith was being tested. In the fall of 1985, the stream of life carried us to Australia where we found people who loved what we were teaching. We were using games to teach socially responsible entrepreneurship and investing. By December of 1985, we actually made a small profit on a seminar we held in Sydney and that is one of the reasons why Kim and I love Australia and will always be grateful to the people of Australia. We had let go and the current of life carried us to Australia and Australians gave us chance to develop as teachers. Change of friends one day in 1986, out of the blue, I received a call from John Denver's Windstar Foundation. John was hosting an event in Aspen, Colorado and wanted to know if I would be one of the guest speakers, along with several other entrepreneurs including Ben Cohen and Jerry Greenfield, founders of Ben and Jerry's Ice Cream. Of course I said yes. Being in a large tent on John's property in Aspen was much like being in Bucky's Dome in Montreal. The feeling of magic, wonder, and possibilities was the same. For some reason, I did not speak on my rock and roll business. It didn't seem to fit. For some reason and totally unprepared I spoke on education and learning. I spoke about the pain I went through in school, about knowing what I wanted to study but being forced to study subjects I had no interest in. I spoke about the emotional pain I went through in failing high school English twice, because I could not write well. I spoke for the kids like me, kids who wanted to learn but didn't like school. I spoke about how so many children have their spirits crushed in the traditional process of learning. At the end of my talk, I asked everyone in the group to close their eyes, join hands, and listen to Whitney Houston's latest release, The Greatest Love of All. The opening line of the song fit the mood and the message, I believe the children are our future. There weren't many dry eyes in the audience as I left the stage in silence. The audience, this group of seagulls, were hugging each other, some crying, much as I had cried that day in 1981 when I was in the audience that first time with Bucky Fuller. The tears were of love, not sadness. They were tears of responsibility, not blame. They were tears of gratitude, gratitude for the gift of life. And they were tears of courage, knowing that changing the world requires courage, courage that comes from the heart. Many in this group of seagulls already knew that the word courage comes from the French word, le cur, the heart. Windstar was a gathering of gulls, most of whom already knew how to fly. They knew flying took courage. Kim was waiting for me as I stepped down from the stage and we hugged silently. We knew we had found our spiritual profession, our spiritual job and our life's purpose. We knew then that we'd found what was to become, and still is, our life's work. Ironically being a teacher was the not on my list of answers to the question what do you want to be when you grow up. Being an attorney was a higher calling than being a teacher. It is not that I hated school. I hated being forced to learn what I did not want to learn. I hated not learning what I wanted to learn, which was to understand money and be financially free like my rich dad. I did not want to be a slave to a paycheck, job security, and a school teacher's pension, like my poor dad. The business booms, once Kim and I were clear on our spiritual jobs, our little educational company expanded to New Zealand, Canada, Singapore, Malaysia, and the US business boomed. Ten years later, in 1994, when we sold that business to our partner, Kim, and I were financially free. Kim was 37 years old and I was 47. We achieved financial freedom without jobs, without government support, and without a retirement plan filled with stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. When people began asking us how we achieved financial freedom without the traditional investment and retirement plans, Kim and I knew it was time for us to begin our new second chance. Following one of Buckminster Fuller's generalized principles a principle that is true in all cases, no exceptions we began our next business. Today that business is known as the Rich Dad Company. The generalized principle we followed was, the more people I serve, the more effective I become. 
With the intent on serving more people, Kim and I began developing our cash flow registered game and I began writing Rich Dad Poor Dad. On my 50th birthday, April 8, 1997, the Rich Dad Company was officially launched. Our mission, to elevate the financial well-being of humanity. A second chance for the Rich Dad Company as I stated in Chapter 1 of this book, the world of money is changing and, unfortunately, millions of people are not. The reason Kim and I continued on with the Rich Dad Company, although we are both financially free, is because of the company mission, a mission of offering more people a second chance at money and life. Today, through the development of electronic games and apps, the Rich Dad Company finds itself poised for yet another second chance, a chance to serve more people using the tools and technology of the information age. The beauty of second chances is that you can have as many as you need or want, without any limits. Each of us has the power to choose to pursue a second chance, as opposed to whining about what might have been. And the more we learn, and the more aware each of us is about the ever-changing world we live in, the better our odds of succeeding as we commit to a second chance. Dr. Fuller's last book was Grunch of Giants. Grunch is an acronym, which stands for Gross Universal Cash Heist. Grunch was published after his death in 1983. Grunch was Fuller's only book to focus on many of the same things my rich dad was concerned about, specifically how the monetary system is designed to steal our wealth. Reading Grunch of Giants in 1983 pushed me over the edge. I knew I could no longer be a manufacturer. Although I did not know what to do, I knew I had to do something. I knew too much and I could no longer stay silent. Fuller had taught us how to see the future and even then I could see this crisis coming, a financial crisis that began in our educational system. In the following chapters, I will explain what I learned and why we are in a financial crisis we face today. This cash heist is not new. It has been going on for a long time. For those who seek a second chance, Understanding what Fuller calls the grunge of giants and what he saw for the future is essential to creating a brighter future for you and your family. Chapter 3, What Can I Do? I just invent, then wait until man comes around to needing what I've invented. Our Buckminster Fuller It took me a while to realize that Bucky Fuller's ability to predict the future had nothing to do with picking stocks, timing markets, betting on horses, or predicting who will win the World Series. His vision of the future had to do with God's view of the future. Bucky was hesitant to use the word God because, for many people, that word carried a lot of religious dogma, emotion, and controversy. Fuller did not think God was a white guy, a Jew, an Arab, or an Asian. Rather than use the word God, he preferred the Native American term, the Great Spirit. The Great Spirit is the invisible energy that binds all things in universe, not just heaven and earth. Whenever I use the term God in this book, please know I am not making religious references. I respect a person's right to choose to believe in God, or not to believe in God or follow any religion. Simply said, I believe in religious freedom and the freedom to choose whether or not they believe in God. The same is true for politics. I am not a Republican or Democrat. I have no dog in that fight. In fact, I like my dog more than I like most politicians. Human Evolution Fuller was not a futurist in the arena of money. He was a futurist on the Great Spirit's wishes for humanity's evolution. He believed humans were God's long-term experiment, placed here on spaceship Earth to see if humans could evolve, if they could, or would, turn planet Earth into a heaven on Earth, or hell on Earth. Fuller believed Great Spirit wanted all humans to be rich. He often said, there are six billion billionaires on Earth. That was in the 1980s. Today he would say seven billion billionaires. In the 1980s there were fewer than 50 documented billionaires. A far cry from the six billion that Bucky cited. By 2008 there were 1,150. Today that figure is projected at 1,645. Fuller predicted that humanity had reached a critical evolutionary point. 
if humans did not evolve from greed and selfishness to generosity and abundance, humans as an experiment on earth would end. He often referred to the rich and powerful who hoarded God's abundance only for themselves as blood clots. He believed that if humans did not evolve we would not only kill ourselves, but also kill the ecology of planet earth. The reason Fuller sought to identify the generalized principles is because they are the invisible forces that run the universe. In other words, the generalized principles were the operating principles of the Great Spirit, and the Great Spirit wanted all humans and all life on planet Earth to thrive. Fuller believed there were 200 to 300 generalized principles. At the time of his death he had discovered about 50. I am aware of and use about five of them. In his writing and talks, he was critical of a few greedy, powerful people who used humans and the resources of planet Earth only for their personal wealth. He believed that if humans did not shift from greed to generosity humans working for a planet that worked for everyone and everything humans would be evicted from spaceship Earth. The Great Spirit's experiment would be set back a few million years. He also said that God was patient and willing to wait for humans to evolve. Unfortunately, you and I do not have the luxury of waiting another million years for our fellow humans to get the message. Serving more people, as stated in the previous chapter, one of the Great Spirit's generalized principles that Fuller identified was, the more people I serve, the more effective I become. As part of my own second chance, I do my best to follow this generalized principle when making business decisions. Rather than just work to make myself richer, I began to condition myself to think about how to enrich others while I was enriching myself. That generalized principle was instrumental in our decision to sell the seminar business that Kim and I founded to our partner. Although that seminar business was successful, it was limited in terms of the number of people it could serve. In 1994, it was difficult for us to sell that seminar business, a business we loved, were successful in building and making profitable. Yet, intuitively, we knew it was time to move on. It was time to seek ways to serve more people. In 1994, we were financially free. That freedom came not from Bucky Fuller's lessons, but from following Rich Dad's lessons. Financial freedom gave us the time to develop our next business. In 1996, the first commercial version of our cash flow registered game was played in Las Vegas and, one week later, in Singapore. The next step was to develop a marketing plan to sell that game. The cash flow game had two inherent problems that made it difficult to sell. The first problem was that it was too complex. A game expert we hired advised us to dumb it down or it would not sell. We decided against that recommendation. The cash flow game was designed to be an educational game, not a game for entertainment. The second problem with the game was that it was very expensive to produce. The same game consultant told us the game should retail for $29.95. At $29.95 retail, our cost of manufacturing had to be no more than $7 per game. Our problem was that the first production run of the game cost over $50 per game to produce in China, landed, and warehoused in the United States. Against the advice of the game expert, we set the cash flow game's retail price at $195, making it one of the most expensive board games on the market. But adversity leads to innovation. To sell the game a $195 game, Kim and I had to be innovative. We went to our past seminar clients and offered a $500, Oneida seminar featuring our game. During the seminar, the participants played our new game twice. The first time was to get familiar with the game. The second time to get into the game. The one-day seminar worked. Participants were excited, most claiming they learned more about money in one day than they had learned in a lifetime. When we announced the used games were for sale for $150, they were gone instantly. In fact there was a fight for used games, even though there were new games available for $195. The business model worked and the cash flow club concept was born. In 2004, the New York Times ran an article, 
the rising value of play money, on cash flow clubs and told us that they had identified over 3,500 clubs all over the world. Many clubs are still in existence today, teaching and serving more people than Kim and I could ever do on our own. Q, if you want to serve more people, why didn't you offer the game for free? A, we considered using government grants to fund the manufacturing of the games, but that would have been following my poor dad's mindset, rather than my rich dad's entrepreneurial way of thinking. Also, giving people things for free often keeps them poor. It encourages the entitlement mentality that destroys initiative and personal responsibility. In spite of the high initial cost of the game, the online game is free to millions of people. One game can and has taught hundreds of people, for free, through cash flow clubs. Many cash flow club leaders around the world support the mission of Rich Dad, which is to elevate the financial well-being of humanity, and teach the game to others. For them, not only is teaching spiritual, but the more they teach, the more they learn. Most cash flow club leaders I have talked with report getting back far more than they give. They follow the religious principle of give and you shall receive. Unfortunately, there are clubs that only present the game to sell other products or business opportunities. If you encounter one of those clubs, just know that while I support free enterprise, I do not support people using my games as marketing tools. Other points of view, for about six months, I sat in the quaint, artist's town of Bisbee, Arizona, in an old jail that had been converted into an apartment. At one time, John Wayne owned that old jail, as a rental property. He loved Bisbee and southern Arizona, where he owned a large ranch. During the day, I was working on my small ranch, converting an old stagecoach depot, a stopping point between Bisbee and the infamous town of Tombstone, where the gunfight at the OK Corral took place, into a one-bedroom home. At night I would sit in the jail, writing a book. It was a painful process. There were many starts and stops, fits and starts. Finally, late one night, exhausted from working on my property and tired of struggling with a book concept, my fingers began typing the opening lines of a new book. It began with the words I had a rich dad and I had a poor dad. And that's how the book, Rich Dad Poor Dad, was born. Most people don't know that Rich Dad Poor Dad, the book that started the Rich Dad series, was written as a brochure to market the cash flow game. On April 8, 1997, my 50th birthday, Rich Dad Poor Dad was launched and the Rich Dad Company was born. Rich Dad Poor Dad floated around in the world of self-published books until early in the year 2000. It was selling virally, by word of mouth and one day it made the New York Times bestsellers list. It was the only self-published book on that prestigious list. Soon after that, a producer from Oprah Winfrey's TV show called. But before she would book me for Oprah, she wanted to talk with Rich Dad's son. As soon as she verified the story of Rich Dad and Poor Dad, my guest appearance on Oprah was confirmed. I was in Australia when the invitation came. It was a tough decision, should I stay in Australia, or fly to Chicago for the interview. Again the principle of the more people I serve, the more effective I am kicked in. Cutting my trip short, I flew directly from Australia to Chicago. I still remember walking onto Oprah's stage, sitting next to her for an hour, and talking about the need for financial education. In that hour, my life changed completely. In one hour I went from an unknown to a world-famous voice for financial education. It had taken only 55 years, years of many successes and failures and many second chances, to become an overnight success. I tell you this story, not to brag or pat myself on my back, but as an example of the power of following Bucky Fuller's generalized principles and my rich dad's lessons on money. The rich are generous, a reporter once asked me if Oprah made me rich. I replied that I was already rich the day I stepped on her stage. I was rich financially because I had spent my life gaining knowledge, knowledge not taught in schools. All I was doing was sharing, being generous with what I knew. My comment on being generous disturbed the reporter. 
his view was that a person had to be greedy to be rich. When I attempted to explain, the generalized principle of unity is plural and, at minimum two that a person could be rich by being greedy and that a person could be rich by being generous his eyes glazed over. His brain was rigidly locked around the idea that the only way to become rich was by being greedy. In his mind, it is not possible to become rich by being generous. In his mind, there is only one kind of rich person, a greedy rich person. Q, what happened after you became famous? Was it smooth sailing after that? A, no. Far from it. Fame and money made life harder, not easier. Many friends became jealous. Partners became greedy and began to steal. And many people came around to see how they could help. It was tough trying to determine if people were coming to truly help with the mission or only to help themselves to what we had created. The good news is that over the years many great people have come into our lives. Again, unity is plural and we had to learn to take the good with the bad. Bucky's last words, as I've said, Fuller died on July 1 in 1983. His wife and died 36 hours later. Both were 87 years old. Even in death, his life was supernatural. He was speaking at an event, which would be his last, when he abruptly stopped and sat quietly for a moment. I was not at that event, but I did listen to an audio tape of his final words from that event. I will paraphrase his final words. Bucky said he was cutting his talk short because his wife was gravely ill. He mentioned he'd had a premonition a few days earlier. His premonition was that he and his wife were to die together. Realizing death was near for both of them, he said there is something mysterious going on. He encouraged everyone to continue on with the work, ending his talk with his usual parting words, Thank you, darling people. I later learned that he and his wife had made a pact that neither of them would ever see the other die. They kept their pact. Rushing to see her, Bucky sat at her bedside, where she was in a coma. As if on cue, he put his head down next to her, and silently passed on. She followed, 36 hours later, keeping their pact to never see the other die. He was a futurist who predicted how he and his wife would die. I guess he could hear the great spirit calling them home. I was driving on a freeway in Honolulu when the news of their deaths came over the radio. The news so overwhelmed me that I pulled over on the side of the highway and cried. Looking back, it's clear to me that, as I was sitting on the side of the highway that emotional day, one phase of my life had ended and another had begun. I was given a new second chance. I was no longer to be an entrepreneur in manufacturing. I was about to become an entrepreneur in education. Grunch of Giants, a few months later, Bucky's final book, Grunch of Giants, was released posthumously. As I've mentioned, Grunch stands for Gross Universal Cash Heist and refers to how the rich and powerful steal our wealth via our money, government, and banking system. As I read this tiny, yet potent book, many pieces of the puzzle began to fall in place. My mind drifted back in time, when I was nine years old, in the fourth grade, and I raising my hand to ask my teacher, when will we learn about money, and why are some people rich and most people poor? In reading Grunch, the answers slowly seeped into my head. Fuller was very critical of the educational system, not only because of what it was teaching, but how it taught children to learn. He had this to say about every child and his or her special genius, every child is born a genius, but is swiftly dejneused by unwitting humans and slash or physically unfavorable environmental factors. And I observe that every child demonstrates a comprehensive curiosity. Children are interested in everything and are forever embarrassing their specialized parents by the wholeness of their interests. Children demonstrate right from the beginning that their genes are organized to help them to apprehend, comprehend, coordinate, and employ in all directions. Fuller recommended that students take control of their education process. In essence, do what Steve Jobs did at Reed College in Portland, Oregon. Steve Jobs dropped out of school so he could drop back in, studying only subjects that interested him. 
Steve never went back to school. Q, did Bucky Fuller say everyone has a genius? A, yes. Q, but I don't feel very smart. I don't think I have a genius. Why is that? A, as Bucky says, schools and parents often news children. Fuller used the metaphor of school being a diamond mine. Teachers dig into the mine looking for diamonds the kids they think are geniuses. The tailings, or the dirt and rubble that toss to the wayside, are the students the teachers believe have no genius potential. That is why so many students leave school feeling that they're not smart, not bright, not special, even angry at school and the school system. Q, so how does a person find their genius? A, there are many ways. One way is by changing their environment. Q, what does environment have to do with my genius? A, let me give you some examples. Many students feel stupid in the environment of a classroom, yet their genius comes alive on a football field. Tiger Woods' genius comes alive on the golf course. The Beatles' genius came alive, with guitars and drums, in a recording studio. Steve Jobs dropped out of school, yet his genius came alive in his garage, where he and Steve Wozniak developed the first Apple computer. Q, so why don't I feel smart? Why can't I find my genius? A, because most people go from home to school to work, environments that are not always the right environment for their genius to bloom. Many spend their lives feeling unfulfilled, untested, unappreciated, simply because they did not find the environment in which their genius could blossom. Think of genius as three words, genie in us, the magician in us. The words genius, magician, and inspire are all related. Do you know someone who is a magician in the kitchen, someone who can take ordinary ingredients and create gourmet meals? Q, yes. A, do you know someone who has a green thumb? Someone who can take dirt, water, and seeds and create a magical garden? Q, sure. A, have you ever watched the Special Olympics, an event for physically challenged children, and been inspired spiritually touched when they compete with all their hearts, undaunted and in spite of their disabilities and challenges? Q, I have. A, those are examples of genie in us, when the magician in us inspires others. We feel inspired when the spirit in someone else touches the spirit in us. That is what genius is. When someone inspires us, we're reminded of the genie in us. Q, so why don't most people find their genius? A, because being a genius is not easy. For example, someone could be the next Tiger Woods, but if that person does not dedicate their life to developing their genius, their talents, their genie will never show its magic. More questions than answers for me, reading Grunch only raised more questions. And for the first time in my life, I wanted to be a student again. I wanted to go back to the fourth grade and find the answers to the flurry of questions I kept asking my teacher about money. I was hungry to learn, and I wanted answers to my questions, why is money not a subject taught in school, and what makes rich people rich? As I finished reading Grunch and went on to read Fuller's other books on education, I realized my questions in the fourth grade were caused by my natural curiosity. Money and why the rich are rich were my subjects of study. And, in my opinion, it's not by accident that the subject of money had been sanitized from academic study. In 1983, the student in me came alive again and I did exactly as Fuller described. The student in me got back to my studies. Over the years, my own studies verified Fuller's findings that the monetary system was designed to steal our wealth, making the rich richer, but not making you and I rich. This enslavement of others and theft of another's wealth has been going on ever since the first humans walked the earth. Fuller believed that intense greed and desire to enslave fellow humans was humanity's evolutionary test, a test to see if we could use our hearts and minds to create heaven on earth or if we would turn earth into a living hell and environmental wasteland. In Grunge of Giants, Fuller described how the rich and powerful used money, banks, government, politicians, military leaders and the educational system to implement their plans. 
simply said, money is designed to keep people slaves to money and slaves to those who control the monetary system. Ironically, and although Bucky Fuller and my rich dad would be polar opposites on the subject of money, they both would have agreed on the concept of money enslaving people. And their polarity supports and validates the generalized principle of unity is plural, both men disagreeing on substance, but agreeing in principle. The power of knowledge soon after I appeared on Oprah, a mutual fund company offered me $4 million to endorse their mutual fund. While I like money as much as the next guy, accepting their money would have been selling out to grunge. One of the great things about financial education is it gives people the power to choose, and to never need to sell their soul for money. What can you do? You and I both knew this was coming. Q, so what can I do? A, the answer is there are many things you can do. The world is filled with problems. A better question might be, what problem do you want to solve? What problem do you think God gave you unique gifts to solve? You can do it by yourself or you can join a group or an organization in solving the problem that causes you concern. When you look at the world from the point of view of problems to solve, you will see that there is a lot to do and a lot you can do. A more important question is, are you willing to work on solving the problem? Or are you willing to work only if someone will pay you money? In the next chapter, you will learn what I learned while looking for the answer of how our wealth is stolen via our money system and why there is no financial education in our schools. By creating the cash flow board game and writing Rich Dad Poor Dad, our wealth, income, and recognition went up exponentially. I mention this for those of you who are wondering when I will get around to what you can do for your second chance in life. For those of you considering a second chance with your money and your life, you may want to ask yourself, how can I serve more people, rather than, how can I make more money? If you ask yourself how you can serve more people rather than simply make more money you are following one of the generalized principles of God. Chapter 4 What is a Heist? The Dark Ages still reign over all humanity, and the depth and persistence of this domination are only now becoming clear. This Dark Ages prison has no steel bars, chains, or locks. Instead, it is locked by misorientation and built of misinformation. R. Buckminster Fuller When I read this quote in this book Cosmography, another posthumous book that followed Grunch, the idea that we were in the Dark Ages rattled my brain. I wanted to learn more. My question was, how does Grunch keep us in the Dark Ages? For me, reading Grunch of Giants was like putting together the first 100 pieces out of a 1,000-piece jigsaw puzzle. The 100 pieces from Fuller's Grunch of Giants, interlocked with the other 100 puzzle pieces my rich dad had linked together for me years before. The puzzle was beginning to take shape and make sense. I began to understand how our wealth was being stolen, via a heist of our money. In 1983, I believed I had about 200 pieces of a 1,000-piece jigsaw puzzle. I could see a picture forming and I wanted to learn more. For the first time in my life, I was truly a student. I wanted to learn more. And I knew I could not learn what I needed to learn by staying still, so I decided to do what Fuller had done in 1927. I took a leap of faith into the unknown. Q, why the unknown? A, because I really didn't know what the future would hold. My only thoughts were, if Bucky Fuller found his genius leaping into the unknown in 1927, maybe I should, and could, too. I wasn't too bright in school so I thought that maybe I'd be smarter in the unknown. Q, what was driving you? Why give up a good life for something that was unknown? A, injustice. I grew up in the 60s, an extremely turbulent time. There were protests against the war in Vietnam and race riots at home. In 1965, I left my sleepy hometown of Hilo, Hawaii and went to school in New York, at the Merchant Marine Academy. My roommate was a young black man, and who today to be politically correct I should refer to as African American. Tom Jackson was my first African American friend, because in Hilo, there were no African Americans. With race riots in the news every night, Jackson would fill in the blanks, 
giving me the other side of the story. We all know there is racial discrimination. There was discrimination in Hawaii, the whites, called Haoles, versus Asians, and Hawaiians but it was not near the levels of discrimination my friend Tom experienced. Q, so it's racial discrimination that drives you. A, yes and no. There will always be discrimination. It is injustice that drives me. After graduating from Kings Point, the Merchant Marine Academy, in 1969 I went to flight school in Florida, not far from Alabama. A white classmate from flight school invited me to his home in Birmingham, the city at the epicenter of the 1960s race riots. Q, and what did you learn? A, that racial discrimination is financial discrimination. The blacks were fighting for the opportunity for a better life. In talking with other people in Alabama, both white and black, it became clear to me that they were struggling for the same thing, a better life. You may recall that the protests and riots at the time was over integration of their schools. Both blacks and whites wanted better education for a better life. Q, so what is the injustice? A, the injustice is the lack of financial education in our schools. People go to school for a better life, yet few learn anything about money. Q, and today, the same problem exists. People still go to school but learn very little about money. Is that the injustice? A, yes. Today, people of all races and all socio-economic classes rich, middle class, and poor are struggling for money. This causes people to panic over whether or not their child is getting the best education possible, so they can get a good, high-paying job. Ironically, their child will learn little, if anything, about money. Q, so. I'm not seeing what the injustice is. A, the injustice is financial ignorance. Today, almost everyone in every part of the world is having their wealth stolen via the financial system, via their money. And most do not even realize it. Their wealth is being stolen via their work, savings, and investments in the stock market. If things do not change, I am afraid the rioting of the 60s will return, and this time it will not be race riots. When I was 18, Tom Jackson, my roommate at Kings Point, took me home with him to Washington, D.C. That trip disturbed me to the core. And visiting my white friend's home in Birmingham, Alabama, right after race riots in that city, also disturbed me deeply. Today, I see the same creep of panic and poverty bleeding into all corners of society. I know why drugs and crime are professions of choice in inner cities. Crime pays more than a job. And drugs relieve the pain people are in. At least drugs and crime can put food on the table and a roof over your head. Today that pain has spread across all levels within our society. Money and ignorance do not discriminate. The lack of financial education is the injustice. And reading Grunch of Giants just made me want to learn more. As Fuller said, you can never learn less, you can only learn more so that is why Kim and I took our leap of faith in 1984. We really did not know what to do. All we knew was that we had to do something. The power of the paycheck Rich Dad said, the paycheck is one of the most powerful tools ever created by man. The person who signs the paycheck has the power to enslave another person's body, mind, and soul. He also said, when slavery was abolished, the rich created paychecks. This is why chapter 1 in Rich Dad Poor Dad is titled The Rich Don't Work for Money. Q, so how do we end this injustice? A, it starts with words. Words are tools Fuller often said, words are tools. Since words affect our minds, he believed words are some of the most powerful tools invented by humans, which is why he chose his words carefully. Bucky believed many people struggled with life simply because they used words that disempowered them, made them weak, confused, fearful, sometimes even angry. When Rich Dad wouldn't allow his son Mike and me to say I can't afford it, he was echoing Bucky's belief that words can steal your power and make you weak. Instead, we were to ask ourselves how can I afford it, and challenge our brains to expand our means. 
The words we choose and use either open our minds or close them, make us feel powerful and creative or powerless victims of life. That's the power of words. My rich dad also agreed with Fuller when it came to financial words. For example, rich dad believed many people were poor simply because they used poor words. If you read rich dad poor dad, you may recall my poor dad often said, my house is an asset. And my rich dad would say, your father may be a highly educated man, but his house is not an asset. It's a liability. Millions of people are poor or struggle financially simply because they use poor or incorrect words. Millions of people struggle financially because they refer to their liabilities as assets. Rich Dad's definitions were simple. They were, assets put money in your pocket. Liabilities take money from your pocket. He would then draw a simple diagram of a financial statement to illustrate his definitions. He used diagrams because a picture is worth a thousand words. As you can see from the diagram, the key word that determines an asset or liability is cash flow. It's possible that these two words cash flow are the most important words in financial education. Words can make you rich at the age of nine, I knew I was going to be a rich man, simply because rich dad taught me the meaning of financial words. I knew I was going to be rich because I knew the difference between assets and liabilities. At the age of nine, I knew my job was to acquire assets and minimize liabilities. This was not rocket science. I was only nine years old and I could understand those concepts. The difference between most Americans, of any age, and me is that someone, in this case, my rich dad, took the time to teach me the words, the language of money, so I could feel knowledgeable and strong and in control of my money and by extension my life. Maybe this is where your second chance starts. Rich Dad began our financial education, learning the definition of words, by playing Monopoly. At the age of nine, I knew that one greenhouse was an asset, when it produced, let's say, $10 of cash flow, money flowing into my pocket. Two greenhouses put $20 in my pocket. The math was not hard. Knowing the definition of financial words was powerful, and life-changing. As I grew older and more experienced, my wealth increased as my financial vocabulary increased. As I've stated earlier, knowledge is power. Knowledge begins with words. And the best news of all, words are free. As Fuller said, words are tools, the most powerful tools created by humans. Words are fuel for our brains. Using poor words is like putting low-quality gasoline in a car it affects long-term performance and can impact a person's entire life. Another way of putting this is, poor people are not poor. They are using poor words to power their powerful brains. Money alone can never end poverty. Many people give poor people money out of kindness. Oftentimes giving money to poor people only keeps them poor longer. If we want to see an end to poverty, we should begin by upgrading the words poor people use. Entitlement mentality An early lesson from my Sunday school class is, give a man a fish, and you feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish and you feed him for life. Teaching people to become self-reliant begins with words of empowerment rather than words of entitlement. Many in the middle class struggle because they, too, use poor words. Many in the middle class use the word save money, which is ridiculous when banks and governments are printing money on presses that are running at high speed. Millions of middle class people and amateur investors invest for the long term. That too makes no sense when professional investors, using HFT high frequency trading are investing for milliseconds. For HFT traders, long term is a half second. Financial confusion Millions of people struggle financially because they use words they do not understand. Many times, so-called financial experts use financial terms or jargon to sound intelligent and to confuse their client. For example, I once attended a financial seminar and the financial expert was using words like stochastic, moving averages and dark pools. As the saying goes, if you can't dazzle them with your brilliance, Baffle them with your BS. 
The reason so many people lose money when investing is because someone baffled them with financial BS. One word that amused Rich Dad was the word broker. He often chuckled when someone used that word, saying, the reason a person is called a stock broker or a real estate broker is because they are often broker than you are. Rich Dad thought it was a high risk to take investment advice from someone who did not eat unless they sold you something. He also said, most people get financial advice from salespeople, not rich people. That is why most investors lose money. Rich Dad had nothing against salespeople. Instead he said, it is up to the investor to know the difference between good financial advice and a sales pitch. As Warren Buffett says, Wall Street is the only place that people ride to in a Rolls Royce to get advice from those who take the subway. The power of words Rich Dad would not allow his son and me to use words like I can't. And I can't afford it. Rich Dad would say that the people who use those words the most are poor people. He would often say, people say I can't work for people who say I can. Rather than say, I can't afford it Rich Dad instructed us to ask, how can I afford it? And in place of the word hope, he preferred the words I intend or I will. Like Dr. Fuller, Rich Dad was very careful about the words he used. Although he was not very religious, he often used lessons from Sunday school to make his points. When reminding us of our word choices and the power they have, Rich Dad would quote from the book of John, and the word became flesh. The cash heist when Bucky used the word heist in the title of his book, I was a bit shocked. Heist is a very strong word and I was sure Fuller thought long and hard before incorporating that word into the title of his book. I wondered if Bucky was angry when he chose that title or simply knew his time on spaceship Earth was limited. It's clear that wanted to make a strong statement. Finishing Grunge of Giants in 1983, I immediately looked up the word heist. The simple definitions of the word heist are, one noun, a robbery to verb, steal again, I thought his use of the word heist was a bit strong, direct, and dangerous because he was using the word heist in connection with institutions we trust, hold sacred, institutions that are at the core of our culture. Until he wrote Grunge of Giants, Fuller was generally known as the friendly genius. His use of the word heist was a departure from his reputation for benevolence. Accusing our schools, banks, legal system, government, politicians, and military of a gross universal cash heist was a departure for the friendly genius. It was at that point that I decided to do some of my own research. What I found deeply disturbed me. The heist of education The first two questions I asked myself were, who controls education? And who determines what is taught in our schools? What I learned troubled me. In 1903, John D. Rockefeller created the General Education Board. There was much controversy about why he created this organization. Some people say he created the General Education Board to improve education. Others say he created it to hijack the educational system of the United States. While heist and hijack are not the same words, they have similar meanings. Around the same time, another of the robber barons, Andrew Carnegie, promoted his foundation for the advancement of teaching. It seems both Rockefeller and Carnegie were working to influence the American education agenda, directing what students were taught in school. The question is, what was their agenda? I'm reminded, again, that the generalized principle, unity is plural, and at minimum two, applies. While some people will say Rockefeller and Carnegie were working for the good or our children, others say exactly the opposite. In my search, I came across reports, written 60 to 100 years ago, inflammatory reports from credible people, reports that were hard to believe. What they accused Rockefeller and Carnegie of orchestrating, and the words they used, are best not repeated. Today, looking back on those reports with decades of hindsight, there does seem to be some validity to the concerns. Those most critical of Rockefeller and Carnegie accused the two men of wanting to break the American spirit and using the education system to do it. Americans are individuals who left their countries of birth for freedom from oppression and for the opportunity of a better life. 
a shot at the American dream. This made the DNA of Americans too strong, too independent, and too ambitious to be subservient to the rich and powerful. Those critical of Carnegie and Rockefeller believed that before the rich and powerful people like Rockefeller and Carnegie could gain further control over Americans and the wealth of America, the American spirit had to be weakened and Americans made dependent upon the government for financial support. Q, and is this why there is no financial education in our schools? A, it's certainly possible. Today, when you look at the chart I used in Chapter 1, there does seem to be some validity to the concerns of credible people decades ago. Dependent upon the government it's tough to argue with statistics. And it appears that Americans are becoming more dependent upon the government, and that the entitlement mentality is replacing the American dream. As we've seen before, decline of the middle class, now look again at the chart on the next page on the decline of the middle class in America. And then take another look at the chart of the Social Security Fund. Dependent upon Social Security today in America, there are approximately 70 to 80 million baby boomers getting ready to retire. Approximately 65 million Americans 38 million households have little to nothing set aside for retirement. That means more than 60 million people may soon be dependent upon the U.S. government to take care of them. Q, are you saying that, 60 to 100 years ago, the people who accused the rich, the grunge people, of using the education system to weaken the American spirit were ostracized, made to sound like quacks and heretics? A, yes. Education is supposed to be pure, hallowed, for higher purposes only. To accuse robber barons such as Carnegie and Rockefeller of intentionally weakening the spirit of the American people via education was considered heresy. Rockefeller's General Education Board proclaimed that they were taking young people out of the agrarian age and training them for the industrial age. And they did do that. Yet, if you look at what's going on in America and the world today, it's not hard to see that Americans are becoming more dependent upon the government for life support. America today is less a democracy and more an oligarchy, a country with a few extremely rich, powerful people and a growing gap between the rich and everyone else. In many ways, America is becoming more like modern-day Russia, a land of oligarchs, than the democratic America our founders envisioned. Regardless of whether you believe Rockefeller and Carnegie were working for good or evil, what I found through my research validated Fuller's concern about grunge, the ultra-rich and powerful, the oligarchs, taking control of important institutions such as education and why there is little if any financial education in schools. In 1935 President Franklin D. Roosevelt introduced Social Security during the height of the Great Depression. Today, Social Security, Medicare, food stamps, and now Obamacare are part of the DNA of the American culture. It seems that more and more Americans today cannot survive without these government programs. So why would the ultra-rich and ultra-powerful work to influence education and leave out financial education? I leave that to your imagination. Teacher of the Year in 1983, it was almost sacrilegious to criticize education. In many ways, education was on the same level as religion. Yet, as I did my research, I came across teachers who were defecting, like priests walking away from their church. One such teacher was John Taylor Gatto. And he was no ordinary teacher. He was named New York City Teacher of the Year in 1989, 1990, and 1991 and New York State Teacher of the Year in 1991. Also in 1991, he wrote a public letter in the Wall Street Journal announcing that he planned to quit teaching, saying that he no longer wished to hurt kids to make a living. He is the author of five books including Dumbing Us Down and the Underground History of American Education. The purpose of education There are three economic classes in America, rich, middle class, poor, as stated previously, there was a time when it was illegal to teach a slave to write. Without education a slave would always be poor. My research convinced me that the purpose of modern education was to take poor people and educate them in ways that would create a large middle class of educated workers, executives, professionals, and soldiers, more specifically, 
employees, consumers, and taxpayers. The purpose of modern education was never to take the middle class and make them rich. That, in my opinion, is why there is no financial education in our schools. This is why this chart tells an interesting story. This chart explains why the millionaire next door, described in that book as a person of the middle class who became a millionaire via inflation of their home and retirement account, may not be a millionaire in the near future. And one of the ways grunge steals our wealth begins in our schools, via the lack of financial education. Why savers are losers, like education, saving money is held as sacred. Going to the bank to save money is a bit like going to the church and leaving behind an offering to the financial gods of grunge. Without financial education, how would the average person know that the banks steal their wealth via their savings? They wouldn't. A saver's wealth is heist via a banking mechanism known as the fractional reserve system. The concept of fractional reserve banking is thousands of years old. Why it isn't taught in school is no mystery to me. It's the way banks make money. And it's not pretty. Thousands of years ago, when a merchant wanted to travel across the country, rather than carry gold or silver, the merchant would deposit their gold and silver with a banker for safekeeping. The banker would then issue a claim for that gold on a piece of paper. The merchant would travel from his home to a faraway city, buy goods, and pay for them with the piece of paper called a claim. The seller of the goods would then go to his bank and could claim the payment in gold or he could simply use the piece of paper, the claim, and buy something else. Bankers soon realized that people liked paper the claim because it was more convenient to carry than gold or silver and easier to use in day-to-day -day transactions. It was not long before bankers were printing claims and lending claims to borrowers who wanted money. Things worked well, as long as the owners of the gold and silver did not want their gold and silver back. If and when the owners of the gold and silver realized their banker was lending out more claims to their gold and silver, a run on the bank occurred. A run on the bank occurs when the true owners of the gold and silver no longer trust their banker and turn in their claims for the return of their gold and silver. If the banker has more claims than gold or silver, the bank collapses and savers are losers. This is why the fractional reserve system was created. Simply stated, a bank can only lend out a specified fraction of the money that's in its vaults. There are specific limits to the amounts they can lend. To keep things simple, let's use a fractional reserve of 10. This means, if you deposit $10 into your savings account, the bank can lend out $100, or 10 times your $10, to people who want to borrow money. A diagram of this fractional reserve system makes things a bit easier to understand. The diagram on the previous page illustrates two things, your $10 in savings is your asset your $10 in savings is the bank's liability. Once again, you'll note, unity is plural, and at minimum two. In this case, for there to be an asset there must be a liability. Q, why is my $10 my asset but the bank's liability? A, by definition, assets put money in your pocket and liabilities take money from your pocket. In this example, when you save $10, the bank must pay you interest. So the cash, the interest, flows from the bank's pocket to your pocket. The diagram below explains the process. The bank's assets if the fractional reserve is 10, the bank can lend your $10 10 times. And the $100 in loans made by the bank is an asset for the bank. Q, so the bank's assets are the loans it makes? A, yes. How the bank makes money, let's be generous and say that the bank pays you 5% interest on your savings. When the banks lend that money they will charge between 10% and 50% for letting, qualified borrowers as well as high-risk ones, use your money. That means the bank pays you, your $10 at 5% interest equals 50 cents for one year let's say the bank charges 10% interest on the $100, your $10 x 10, it loans, $100 x 10% equals $10 Q, so the bank pays me 50 cents and they are paid $10 on my $10. A, yes. This is an overly simplified example, 
but this is how the fractional reserve system works. Q. How does this steal my wealth? A. The fractional reserve system devalues the value of your savings. Your $10 now purchases less because your $10 is now $100 in the economy. It's known as inflation. Q. Is inflation bad? A. Inflation is good for debtors and bad for savers, which is why savers are losers. Inflation is why life is harder for millions of people today. Q. Why is life harder? A. Because life becomes more expensive. Q. So that's how my wealth is stolen via the banking system? A. This is one simple example. There are many more. If you take this fractional reserve system to the next level, you will understand why savers really are the biggest losers. Q. The next level? You mean what happens if the borrower of the $100 deposits that $100 back into the bank? A. Exactly. And then the bank lends out $1,000. Q. And what happens to my $10 in savings? A. It's worth less and less. Q. It's worth less and less. A. You got it? The entire modern monetary system is based upon inflation. The banks and governments want inflation. Q. Why? A. For many reasons. One reason is so that debtors can pay back their debt with cheaper dollars. Another reason is because consumers spend money faster if they expect prices to go higher. Q. Why is that? A. Think about it. If a person thinks cars will be 10% higher next year, he or she will buy a car this year. But if they expect the same car to be 10% less next year, they're likely to wait until next year. Q. Doesn't inflation cause people to be gamblers? A. Yes. Many people will buy a house this year hoping to flip it next year. The same is true with stocks and precious metals. Rather than have a stable, growing, and productive economy, we have an economy of speculators and gamblers. People who flip houses or trade stocks add little value to the economy. While they make some money, flippers actually make life harder and more expensive for other people. A person who buys a house for $100,000 and flips it for $120,000, doing little or nothing to improve the property, has added little to the economy, except to make life more expensive. The same is true for a person who buys a stock for $10 and sells it for $15 two days later. They have done little for the economy. Q. Are you saying that is bad? A. No. All I am saying is that's what happens when you have an economy that grows on inflation rather than production. Savers become losers and life becomes harder because life becomes more expensive. Inflation motivates many people to become consumers rather than investors. They eat, drink, and shop, because tomorrow prices may be higher. When people wonder why the gap between the rich and everyone else is growing, some of the blame can be placed on our banks, the fractional reserve system, and of course, the lack of financial education in our schools, schools that actually encourage students to save money. The heist via taxes many people believe paying taxes is being patriotic. Yet, if you study American history you'll learn that the American Revolution began in 1773 as a tax protest known as the Boston Tea Party. For years, America was pretty much a tax-free or low-tax nation. Q. Why do some people think paying taxes is patriotic? A. In 1943, during World War II, the U.S. government passed the current Tax Payment Act. The government needed money to fight the war and needed tax revenue to pay for the war. Until 1943 the government had to wait for taxpayers to pay their taxes. To solve this problem, the current Tax Payment Act was passed. Q. What did the current Tax Payment Act do? A. It allowed the government to get paid before the worker got paid. Bucky Fuller said it allowed the rich to put their hands directly into the workers' pockets. Today, it's a giant, ongoing cash heist that gets bigger and bigger as the government gets needier and the rich get greedier. Remember, the entitlement mentality did not start with the poor. 
the entitlement mentality started at the top with grunge and the plan to heist our wealth via the banks, government, and taxes. The 1943 Current Tax Payment Act gave rise to the military-industrial complex that former general and outgoing President Dwight D. Eisenhower would later warn about in 1961. In 1943, with tax dollars now pouring into the government on a monthly basis, the military-industrial complex could declare war forever. The Cold War began and trillions in tax dollars went into producing weapons of mass destruction. Obviously, Grunch and friends of Grunch profit greatly from war and the fear of war. I've often thought that all Grunch has to do is use the media machine to whip up a potential threat from Iraq, North Korea, Russia, the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, or ISIS, Islamic State, and US taxpayers feel that paying taxes is patriotic. Q, are you saying the threats are not real? A, no I know we have enemies. All I'm saying is that we will always be at war because war is profitable. For centuries, war is how nations have stolen the wealth of other nations. War is a giant cash heist on many levels, and on people, through blood, sweat, and taxes on both sides of the war, real or perceived. Who pays taxes? Pictured below is my rich dad's cash flow quadrant. It is also the title of book number two in the Rich Dad series, Rich Dad's Cash Flow Quadrant. E stands for employee, S stands for self-employed, small business, or specialists, like doctors, lawyers, and consultants. B stands for big business, companies with 500 or more employees. I stands for professional investor, and while many people invest, they may not be professional investors. Professional investor is specific tax category. Taxes and the quadrant taxes tell an interesting story. E and S, those who go to school and get a job pay the highest taxes. B and I, those who operate according to the rules of grunge pay the least taxes. Again, this is why lesson one in rich dad poor dad is the rich don't work for money. People who work for money, for paychecks, have their wealth heist via taxes. When President Obama promised to raise taxes on the rich, he raised taxes primarily on high-income earners in the ENS quadrants. Heist via bailouts How many times have we heard this quote from former Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke repeated? One myth that's out there is that what we're doing is printing money. We're not printing money. In 1994, G. Edward Griffin published his classic book The Creature from Jekyll Island. It is a long, yet easy to read history of the Federal Reserve Bank and includes the history of banks and the banking industry. If you love crime stories, you will love this book. The title, The Creature from Jekyll Island, comes from the story of how the concept of U.S. Federal Reserve Bank was created in secrecy on Jekyll Island, Georgia. It had to be formed in secrecy due to opposition to the concept of a central bank in America. Many of the founders of America were vehemently opposed to a central bank, like the Bank of England, that would control the money supply in America. The founders feared a central bank would eventually have more power than the U.S. government. As English banker named Amschel Rothschild stated, let me issue and control a nation's money and I care not who writes the rules. My take on the core theme of the creature from Jekyll Island is, bailouts are the name of the game. In other words, bailouts are another method grunge uses to heist our wealth. Make no mistake, bailouts are not accidents. Grunge designed bailouts into the system. In 2008, when the bailout of the biggest US banks began, many people thought bailouts were something new, an emergency procedure to save the economy. Nothing could be further from the truth. Bailouts allow banks to lend money to friends and family members of grunge. If friends and family lose the money, they don't pick up that tab the taxpayers do. Bailouts protect grunge. The biggest banks aren't held accountable and do not have to pay for their mistakes. If you and I make financial mistakes, we suffer the consequences even to the point of declaring bankruptcy, going to jail, or losing everything. The Bush bailout during the 1980s, there were the S&L, savings and loan, bailouts. One of the more interesting was the bailout of Silverado savings and loan. Neil Bush, 
another son of former President George H.W. and Barbara Bush, was a member of the board of directors of Denver-based Silverado Savings and Loan. Since his father was vice president of the United States at the time, Neal's role in Silverado's failure was a focal point of media attention. The U.S. Office of Thrift Supervision investigated Silverado's failure and determined that Bush had engaged in numerous breaches of his fiduciary duties involving multiple conflicts of interest. Breaches of his fiduciary duties involving multiple conflicts of interest means the bank violated its responsibilities to its customers, savers, and made loans to Bush's friends for businesses in which he had an interest. Although Bush was not indicted on criminal charges, a civil action was brought against him and the other Silverado directors by the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, the FDIC. The parties reached an out-of-court settlement, with Bush paying $50,000 as part of the settlement. The point I want to make is this, the Denver Post reported that Silverado's collapse cost taxpayers $1 billion. Once again, Grunch, the ultra-rich and the powerful, wins, and taxpayers lose. The Twinkies bailout in 2012, Hostess Brands, makers of Wonder Bread and Twinkies, an iconic cream-filled sponge cake snack, went out of business. The retirement fund for the Hostess truck drivers was also in trouble. It could not make the retirement payments to the drivers. In 2013, President Obama approved a bailout of the driver's pension plan. While many hailed this bailout as benevolent, decent, and necessary to protect the drivers, keep in mind that there are always three sides to every coin. The question is, who did Obama really bail out? The drivers or the Ottenberg family, owners of a 140-year-old bakery business? When the company went down, it meant the Ottenberg family would be the only contributors to the pension plan. If that happened, the Ottenberg family would go bust. Q, are you saying President Obama bailed out the Ottenberg family, not the drivers? A, no. I'm saying Bucky would say, unity is plural, and at minimum two and rich dad would say, a coin has three sides, heads, tails, and the edge. Intelligent people stay on the edge and look at both sides. Since grunge controls the 4MS military, money, mines, and media most of the popular media report on only one side of the coin or the story, in this case the bailout of the drivers. Rarely will you see a news report that delivers two or more sides. Bear in mind that the entitlement mentality starts at the top, not the bottom. This is why Grunch wants the public to believe these bailouts are good for the everyday person Joe the plumber not the ultra-rich. Q you could replace the Bush family bailout with the Ottenberg family bailout couldn't you? A. I believe you can replace Bush and Ottenberg, as well as Rockefeller and Carnegie, the Clintons, Obama, and Romney with grunge. And as I've said, repeatedly, this is why I believe there is no financial education in our schools. People who are uneducated financially do not ask tough questions. All they hear is what they want to believe, and most want to believe the government is there to protect them. In reality, the government exists to protect the rich. That is why the Federal Reserve Bank bailed out the banks, not the homeowners. That is why Fed Chairman Bernanke began printing trillions of dollars as this chart from Chapter 1 shows. Q, was he lying when he said that? A, not really. He just wasn't telling the full truth. Remember, all truth has at least two sides. It was true that the money in circulation was not changing. That's because the money he was printing was going to bail out the banks. The money he was printing was not going into circulation. In 2014, the big banks are flush with cash, but they are not lending that money to small businesses or Joe the plumber. Again, Bernanke bailed out the big banks, but not the homeowners, whose jobs, homes, wealth, and futures were stolen by the big banks. This is one more reason why I believe Fuller used the word heist in the title of his last book. Q, what is the difference between the bank bailouts and the Twinkies bailout? A, the Twinkies bailout sets a new precedent. It expands the scope of bailouts. If you think the bank bailouts were big, 
just wait until the retirement fund bailouts begin. In the world of retirement funds, there are two basic types. DB or defined benefit plan this means the retiree is guaranteed a paycheck for life. DC or defined contribution plan this means the retiree receives only what he or she and their company contributed while the worker was employed. These funds are often called 401, K, S, IRAs, and Roth IRAs. The difference between a DB plan and a DC plan is that the DC can run out of money if retirees live longer than the contributed money lasts or if a market crash causes their retirement to crash with it. The Twinkies bailout was a bailout of a DB, a defined benefit plan. In theory, DB plans have professional management, while most DC plans are managed by the retiree. Bailing out Twinkies can be viewed as yet another example of Wall Street protecting its own. These professional money managers, many with advanced degrees from prestigious schools, should have been working for and protecting the workers but, in reality, they were working for Wall Street. No one really knows just how many of these professionally managed DB funds are in trouble. By bailing out another DB retirement fund, President Obama reinforces the precedent for bailing out other DB funds in trouble. If the economy weakens or if the stock market crashes, the next bailout could be a multi-trillion dollar bailout. Q. Will the workers with a DC pension plan be bailed out? A. It's possible, but I doubt it. Most of the people with DC plans don't work for Wall Street or come from ultra-rich families. Q. Aren't retirement plans protected by the government? A. Not really. The PBGC, the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation, is an insurance company. If pension funds go bust, the PBGC steps in. The problem is the PBGC cannot cover its obligations. In 2014, PBGC's deficit was more than $35.6 billion and growing. The government may soon have to bail out the PBGC. The same bailout provisions are found in the Affordable Care Act, known as Obamacare. The insurance companies involved in this program are protected by government bailout provisions. Remember, a bailout means the rich and powerful make money. But if the rich and powerful lose money, the taxpayer guarantees their bailout. Heist via Nixon President Richard Nixon did a lot to contribute to today's financial crisis. 1971, Nixon took the US dollar off the gold standard. This hurt the poor, the elderly, and anyone on fixed incomes. Taking the dollar off the gold standard also caused a massive boom in the global economy. Even the middle-class millionaire next door got rich via pay raises, rising home values, and soaring retirement portfolios. 1972, Nixon traveled to China and opened the trade doors between the two nations. This was good for owners of factories, who moved their production to China. It was bad for American workers who now had to compete with the low-wag Chinese labor force. 1974, President Nixon resigned in disgrace on August 8 over his involvement in the Watergate scandal. A few days later, on September 2, 1974, ERISA the Employee Retirement Income Security Act was signed into law by President Gerald Ford, who had just replaced Nixon. ERISA morphed into the popular 401k plans that many U.S. employees now subscribe to. Again, look closely at the titles of many government acts, such as the Affordable Care Act. Oftentimes, they are exactly the opposite of what the title implies. Specifically, we're learning that the Affordable Care Act actually made health insurance more expensive for many workers. And with ERISA, the security of an employee's retirement income became much less secure. As stated in the earlier comparison between DB and DC pension plans, a DB plan, in theory, assured a paycheck for life. A DC pension plan funds retirement only as long as there is money in the employee's DC plan. Millions of workers are now counting on the stock market to keep their hopes and dreams of a secure retirement alive. That's gambling not investing. The chart from Chapter 1 poses some interesting questions. The question I ask is, what will happen in the near future? Will the stock market keep going up? Will it go sideways? 
or will it go down? If the stock market crashes, what will happen to the millions of baby boomers with DC pension plans? Will the government bail them out like it bails out the rich and powerful, the members of grunge? Q. If the market crashes, could there be another Great Depression? A. I will let you answer that question for yourself. From my point of view, millions are already in a Great Depression. They are the millions of people who are already relying on government support, or are among the working poor, or feel the stress of a shrinking middle class, all hoping a good education will save them and their kids. The Dark Ages as I've said I wondered when the Dark Ages began. How are we held in a prison that has no steel bars, chains, or locks? One way is a lack of financial education. My research found we the people have been warned for years. For example in 1802 Thomas Jefferson said I believe that banking institutions are more dangerous to our liberties than standing armies. If the American people ever allow private banks to control the issue of their currency, first by inflation, then by deflation, the banks and corporations that will grow up around the banks will deprive the people of all property until their children wake up homeless on the continent their fathers conquered. The Dark Ages are still upon us. In 2014, central banks all over the world are fighting deflation by printing trillions of dollars. Deflation is harder to fight than inflation. The central banks are printing money to prevent the stock market and economy from crashing. This is why the crisis we are in today is the most dangerous in world history. Boom then bust the middle class millionaires next door enjoyed the boom caused by inflation. What are they going to do if the market deflates? What happens if their home prices, stock prices, and pay raises don't go up? What can they do? How to get out of the dark ages? The question is, who's next? What if this cash heist does start in our school system? Q, so what if education is the problem? A, then that's good news because then education can solve the problem for some people. Q, some people? Not all people. A, no, not all people. Q, why not? A, because not all people are willing to learn. Most are hoping that everything will stay the same, and that tomorrow will be the same as yesterday. And that they'll get through another day, and week, and year. Q, will tomorrow be the same as yesterday? A, I'll let you answer that question for yourself. In conclusion using Fuller's process of prognostication looking at the past to see the future it seems, class warfare, in 1971, the poor and working class had their wealth stolen when the US dollar went off the gold standard. In 2007, the middle class had its wealth stolen when millions lost their jobs, their homes, and their retirement savings. Q, who is next? Are the rich next? Or, as Jefferson warned, will our children wake up homeless on the continent their fathers conquered? A. We'll look at answers to that question in the next chapter. Chapter 6 How much is a quadrillion? You cannot get out of the way of things you cannot see moving toward you. Our Buckminster Fuller many of us know there are giant problems ahead. The problem is, we cannot see them. If we could see them, we would probably get out of their way. The Invisible Age in 1974, the financial future for millions of workers changed. In 1974, the Congress of the United States passed ERISA, the Employee Retirement Income Security Act, today known as to the mandate that led to the creation of the 401k. Today, most Western nations have some form of defined contribution plans for workers. For example, Australia calls its plan the superannuation, in Canada it's known as the Registered Retirement Savings Plan, RRSP, and in Japan it's known as the Defined Contribution Pension Plan. That year, 1974, signaled the end of the Industrial Age Retirement Plan for employees. Industrial Age workers had DB, Defined Benefit, Pension Plans. A DB pension plan paid the employee for life. A DC or defined contribution pension plan is exactly that, the worker contributes to the plan. And only funds in a DC pension plan are those contributed to the fund. 
if the plan runs out of money after the employee retires, the worker is out of luck. And, possibly, in financial trouble. A DB pension plan is an industrial age pension plan, a DC pension plan is an information age pension plan. And in the information age, it's easy to watch the markets. In addition to TV and radio reports, we can check stocks and markets 24-7 on the internet or with an app on our phone. If the stock market is up people feel good, and if it's down they worry. Giants you cannot see without financial education, few workers are aware that there are financial markets that are much, much, bigger than the stock market. These giant markets are invisible to the financially uneducated. If any of these giant markets catches a cold, coughs, and sneezes, the hopes and dreams of a comfortable retirement for billions of people may be wiped out by giants they cannot even see. Later in this chapter I will go into further detail about one of these invisible giants, a giant known as the derivatives market, an invisible giant that nearly brought down the world economy in 2007. Before focusing on that giant, it is important to understand why Fuller said, you cannot get out of the way of things you cannot see moving toward you. One of the more important lessons I learned from Fuller was to train myself to see what most people cannot see. How to see the invisible I remember a story Fuller told about seeing his first automobile as a young boy. He recalled how terrified people were and how terrified the horses were. Many people believed the automobile was just a novelty for the rich, a fad that would soon pass. As we all know, the automobile soon replaced the horse as the primary transportation for the masses, and the world changed. The automobile made lives easier and made many people extremely wealthy. The horse is now the novelty of the rich. He told us that story to make a point, that humans could see the automobile. The automobile was the new technology that transitioned the world from agrarian age transportation, the horse, to industrial age transportation, the horseless carriage. His point was that in years past, we could see the changes that would change our lives. In the information age, we cannot see the changes that are changing our lives. In many ways, the information age is the invisible age. Increasing unemployment One reason why unemployment is increasing and high-paying jobs are harder to find is because in the information age, humans are being replaced, much like the horse was replaced by the automobile. In photography, for example, humans were once needed to process film into prints. I still remember taking my roll of exposed film to the local drugstore, dropping it in a little paper bag, and coming back a week later to pick up my pictures. Digital photography not only eliminated tens of thousands of jobs, it wiped out the Eastman Kodak company. Not that long ago, Eastman Kodak was a Fortune 500 company, an industrial age giant that went bankrupt because it was not able to transition from an industrial age company to an information age company. Eastman Kodak was made obsolete by a new technology known as digital photography. Ironically, it was Eastman Kodak that developed digital photography in 1975. The company poured billions into the development of digital photography, but, unfortunately, an old, employee-heavy business model was not compatible with new technology. The company declared bankruptcy in 2012. The point Fuller was making decades ago is that the loss of jobs will continue as the information age marches on. The problem is that people will not see the technology that is replacing them, nor will they see that technology coming. Millions will be happily employed today and suddenly out of work tomorrow, run over by the invisible. As you plan and prepare for your second chance in life, you must be able to see what's ahead, even if it can't be seen with your eyes. The blind leading the blind A bigger problem is that our leaders cannot see the changes that lie ahead. They are as blind as the rest of us. This invisibility of change is one reason why there is gridlock in Washington with extreme adversarial positions being taken in our nation's capital and in capital cities around the world. Our leaders cannot see the changes, all they can see is each other. So they attack each other, rather than the problem. Today our leaders promise many things. They promise to, 
create more jobs retrain workers spend money on infrastructure projects that will create jobs raise test scores so our kids can compete in the global economy keep kids in school longer teach more math and science in schools raise the minimum wage stop bailing out the banks tax the rich reduce corporate taxes and other political plans promises and ideas hoping to prove to you and me that they know what they're doing that they are the man or the woman with the plan and that they will lead us out of this mess yet in reality many are only the blind leading the blind the ability to see the changes we cannot see is the challenge in the information age learn to see the invisible your second chance in life may hinge on your ability to learn to see the invisible q why do i need to learn to see the invisible a because the future belongs to those who can see the invisible those whose minds can see what their eyes can't brain versus mind fuller often spoke about the difference between a human's brain and a human's mind to him they are not the same thing simply said the brain is used to see tangible objects the mind is used to see the invisible fuller said the brain sees objects and the mind sees the invisible relationship between objects the example fuller used in his talks was the relationship between the planets the brain sees the planets while the mind senses the presence of gravity, the invisible force that keeps planets orbiting each other. In the game of golf, golfers will use their brains to see the ball, the hole, and the undulations of the green before striking a putt. The best golfers will use their mind and are able to see an invisible line, as the ball travels over the green to the hole. The golfers who can see that invisible line are the golfers who win tournaments and earn the most money. In overly simplistic terms, human intelligence is located in the mind, not the brain. That may be why F. Scott Fitzgerald said, the test of a first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposed ideas in the mind at the same time, and still retain the ability to function. Unfortunately, most people are trained to use their brains, but not their minds. Only one right answer schools teach students that there is only one right answer. When people believe there is only one right answer, we have arguments, disagreements, divorces, fights, murders, court battles, and wars. Schools teach answers that the brain can memorize, versus relationships that the mind can explore. As Rich Dad said, when you argue with an idiot, there are now two idiots. Two idiots appear when each idiot thinks there is only one right answer. When parents and schools teach children that there is only one right answer, the top of Maslow's hierarchy of needs is squashed and individual self-actualization is retarded. Self-actualization requires, a second chance a shot at a second chance in life requires a person to have the courage to see what most people cannot see. A second chance requires a person who dares to be creative and spontaneous, a person who can come up with multiple answers to solve problems, a person who can accept facts and isn't prejudiced. A second chance requires self-esteem, confidence, achievement, respect for others as well as earning the respect of others. In a single word, self-esteem requires courage. The word courage is derived from the French word le cœur, which means heart. Courage does not come from the brain. The world is filled with highly educated brains that lack the courage to venture into the unknown or take risks because courage comes from the heart, not the brain. A second chance requires knowing the difference between what the brain sees and what the mind sees. A second chance is not about being right or having the right answers. A second chance is about taking action, making mistakes, correcting your course, and bouncing back from failure until you succeed. Unfortunately, this type of behavior is not validated as intelligent behavior in our schools. In fact, it's the exact opposite that is viewed as intelligent. The mystery of the invisible Fuller believed that 99% of the universe is invisible. If that is true, then humans have based much of their existence on less than 1% of what exists, what we can see. Humans have always been aware of the invisible. For thousands of years, humans across the globe have sensed the existence, mystery, and power of the invisible. That is why humans have idolized gods, sanctified sacred places, worshipped animal forms, symbols, 
and humans such as Jesus, Abraham, Mohammed, Buddha, and others. It was through these physical incarnations that humans tapped into the mystery and power of the invisible. When diseases caused epidemics and widespread death, humans went on witch hunts looking for the evil person that brought this evil upon them. The invention of the microscope gave researchers such as Louis Pasteur the ability to see the invisible the germs and bacteria that were killing people, as opposed witches and other evil forces. Modern day witch hunts today, there are modern day financial witch hunts called class warfare. Many people want to believe that it's the rich who are making them poor. While it is true there are some rich witches, people who have committed crimes against other people, most rich people have done good things that have made them rich. During the French Revolution, the era that made the guillotine famous, the poor chopped off the heads of royalty, including Marie Antoinette. The poor also rolled the heads of entrepreneurs, the innovators, risk takers, job creators the future of the French economy. That is what happens when the gap between rich and everyone else gets too wide. Today, the French economy has yet to recover from the days of the guillotine. Once a world power, France is now a socialist state that still vilifies the desire to be rich. Q, is America getting closer to civil unrest? And class warfare? A uh, yes. If the poor and middle class keep blaming the rich for their problems, the gap between rich and everyone else will only grow wider in the information age. Q, why is that? A, in my opinion, there are two reasons. Reason number one is that the rich can hide their wealth in the realm of the invisible. The rich have the resources to move their wealth. When the rich move their wealth, there is less invested in the economy, making life harder for the poor and middle class. Many companies such as Apple earn billions outside of America, but do not bring that money back to America. They keep that money offshore, legally, because U.S. corporate tax laws would take a large percentage of those earnings. If corporate tax rates were reduced, it's likely that more money would return to America and prosperity would increase. Reason number two is that if you are angry at the rich, it makes it harder to see what the rich do that makes them rich. Q, if I am angry I will be less able to see and do what the rich do? A, yes. That's my opinion. You will see only one side of the coin, your side. For an opportunity for a second chance, it's important to understand what the rich do that makes them rich. If you are angry or jealous, you are blind to what the rich do. Knowledge allows people to see. Anger and ignorance causes blindness. The evolution of wealth to better understand what causes the gap between the rich and everyone else, it helps to look at the evolution of wealth over the four ages of humanity the hunter-gatherer age, the agrarian age, the industrial age, and the information age. The hunter-gatherer age during the hunter-gatherer age, humans were equal. It was a one-class society. There was no rich, middle class, or poor. The tribal chief lived in a cave, hut, or tent like everyone else. The chief's cave, hut, or tent did not have hot and cold running water. The chief did not have a private jet. It was true communism, where everyone was equal in one commune, one tribe, one community. No one owned anything. The chief lived, ate, and traveled like the rest of the tribe. The chief did not have access to better hospitals and the chief's kids did not go to better schools. Things were fair and people were equal. When food or game became scarce, or the weather changed, they simply moved. Land had no value. The agrarian age The agrarian age began when humans domesticated animals and planted crops. Land became valuable and a two-class society was born, the rich and the poor, those who owned land and those who did not. The phrase real estate comes from the Spanish language meaning royal estate. The word peasant is derived from French words pays and sant, which means person of the land. Now that land was valuable, the concept of tax and who paid taxes was born, peasants paying the king a tax for the privilege to live and work the king's land. In return for the peasants' tax money, the king promised to protect the peasants from other kings. To keep the peasants under his control, the king would grant large tracts of land to his friends, who were called barons and lords. 
This is where the term landlord comes from. The landlord collected taxes from the peasants and sent the king his portion of those taxes. With these taxes, the king and his lords could now afford to live in castles, while the peasants lived in huts. The royals rode horses and the peasants walked. In time of war, the lord would round up his peasants, buy them weapons, train them, and send them into battle, fighting to protect the property of the rich. The agrarian age was the beginning of a two-class society, rich and poor, royals and peasants. In the agrarian age, the royals got richer, peasants worked harder, paid their taxes, and fought the king's wars for conquests and expansion. Not much has changed. The industrial age The industrial age ushered in a three-class society, the rich, the middle class, and the poor. In the industrial age, a new kind of land became valuable. In the agrarian age, fertile land was valuable. In the industrial age, fertile agricultural land was not required for factories, which is why Henry Ford chose the rocky, less expensive, non-agricultural land that is now Detroit to build his automobile factories. Around factories, middle-class suburbia spread as the middle class become homeowners and lords of their own castles, their homes. As industrialization overtook agriculture, the kings and lords began selling pieces of the royal estate, becoming bankers and offering mortgages to the middle class, so they could buy their own piece of the royal estate. Today, a mortgage payment is the largest expense of most middle class people. The poor continue to make rent payments to their landlords. The industrial age gave rise to a new royalty, known as bankers and industrialists. A few ambitious American bankers and industrialists became known as robber barons. Wikipedia offers the following description of robber barons, in social criticism and economic literature, robber baron became a derogatory term applied to wealthy and powerful 19th century American businessmen that appeared in North American periodical literature as early as the August 1870 issue of the Atlantic Monthly Magazine. By the late 1800s, the term was typically applied to businessmen who used what were considered to be exploitative practices to amass their wealth. These practices included exerting control over national resources, accruing high levels of government influence, paying extremely low wages, squashing competition by acquiring competitors in order to create monopolies and eventually raise prices, and schemes to sell stock at inflated prices to unsuspecting investors in a manner which would eventually destroy the company for which the stock was issued and impoverish investors. People want to believe greed increased exponentially in the industrial age. And it did. Greed and ambition increased because the ability for a poor person to become extremely rich increased dramatically during the industrial age. Many robber barons started out poor and became richer than many kings and queens of the agrarian age. Some of the more famous, or infamous, robber barons are, Andrew Carnegie, Steele, Pittsburgh and New York James Duke, Tobacco, Energy, Durham, North Carolina Andrew W. Mellon, Finance, Oil, Pittsburgh J.P. Morgan, Finance, Industrial Consolidation, New York John D. Rockefeller, Oil, Cleveland, New York Leland Stanford, Railroads, San Francisco California Cornelius Vanderbilt, Water Transport, Railroads, New York Bucky Fuller pointed out that several of these robber barons founded some of the most prestigious colleges and universities in America. Robber barons such as Stanford, Duke, Vanderbilt, Carnegie, and Mellon had their schools named after them. Fuller referred to Harvard University as J.P. Morgan's School of Accounting. John D. Rockefeller founded the University of Chicago in 1891 and the General Education Board in 1903. Rockefeller claimed to have started the General Education Board for the purpose of transitioning bright farm boys and girls from the agrarian age, into the industrial age. Some of these bright young men and women probably became the new lords for the robber barons, known today as CEOs, CFOs, accountants, and attorneys. Many suspected that Rockefeller's real purpose for founding the General Education Board was to control the nation's educational curriculum. As stated earlier, the creation of the General Education Board appears to be a heist of our educational system. 
people suspect Rockefeller wanted to educate the best and brightest young people to be employees and executives, but not entrepreneurs like him. The good news is, many colleges and universities are now offering programs for students who want to be entrepreneurs, rather than executives and employees. Slower to change and evolve was the large-scale integration of financial education into all school curriculums. Class warfare today, there is class warfare in America and across the world. Many people believe that today's rich are reincarnations of the robber barons of old, no more than crooks and thieves. Yet, if you are looking for a second chance in life, it is important to stand on the edge of the coin, and see both sides of the coin, both heads and tails. If you see only one side of the coin you may never fully understand what made the robber barons extremely rich, richer than kings and queens of old. If you see only one side of the coin, you may wind up on the poor side of this growing war among classes. Wikipedia supports the other side of the coin point of view quoting television journalist John Stossel's comments, they weren't robbers, because they didn't steal from anyone, and they weren't barons they were born poor. Vanderbilt got rich by pleasing people. He invented ways to make travel and shipping cheaper. He used bigger ships, faster ships, served food on board. He cut the New York, Hartford fare from $8 to $1. That gave consumers more than any consumer group ever has. Rockefeller got rich selling oil. First competitors and then the government called him a monopolist, but he wasn't. At the time he had well over a hundred competitors. No one was forced to buy his oil. Rockefeller enticed people to buy it by selling it for less. That's what his competitors hated. His finding cheaper ways to get oil from the ground to the gas pump made life better for millions. Working class people, who used to go to bed when it got dark, could suddenly afford fuel for lanterns, so they could stay up and read at night. Rockefeller's greed might have even saved the whales, because when he lowered the price of kerosene and gasoline, he eliminated the need for whale oil. The mass slaughter of whales suddenly stopped. In spite of the good things these capitalists did, many people refer to them derogatorily as robber barons rather than people who made life better for people. In other words, the robber barons were not greedy. They were generous. If you want to become richer, you may want to find ways to become more generous. Ways to serve more people. The information age in 1957, the Soviet Union launched Sputnik, the first satellite to orbit the Earth. Many people mark this event as the start of the information age, the invisible age. We all knew the satellite was there, we just could not see it. Today, there are thousands of satellite satellites we cannot see running many facets of our lives. The information age caused wealth to evolve yet again. Today there is a new type of real estate, invisible real estate. Some people call it cyber real estate. Cyber real estate is why there are 19-year-old billionaires who never finished school and 59-year-old college-educated executives out of work and looking for a job. Cyber real estate is found in our mobile devices such as smartphones, iPads, and computers. When you and I go to Google or Amazon we are no different than a person who lands on Park Place or Boardwalk in the game of Monopoly registered. A few of the new robber barons, the invisible age entrepreneurs who never finished school, are, one Steve Jobs, Apple Computers 2. Steve Wozniak, Apple Computers 3. Bill Gates, Microsoft 4. Larry Ellison, Oracle 5. Tom Anderson, MySpace 6. David Karp, Tumblr 7. Dustin Moskovitz, Facebook 8. Mark Zuckerberg, Facebook 9. Michael Dell, Dell Computers Who Do You Blame? In many ways, you could blame these individuals for the growing gap between rich, poor, and middle class. You could blame them for high unemployment. You could even blame them for the growing numbers of people on government support programs. And we can blame ourselves. As I've stated earlier, when humans cannot see changes, because the changes are invisible, people blame other people. People burn witches, cut heads off with guillotines, and attack each other, 
think Republicans and Democrats, rather than solve problems they cannot see. Why the rich are getting richer in 1967, when my classmate Andy and I hitchhiked to Montreal, Canada, we weren't only going to see Bucky Fuller's Dome, the U.S. Pavilion at Expo 67, the World's Fair on the Future. We wanted to better understand why Fuller often said, God wanted all humans to be rich. Fuller also said and wrote about in his 1981 book Critical Path Technologically we now have 6 billion billionaires on spaceship Earth. To our 20-year-old brains, that statement was outside our reality. It definitely was not an idea taught in school. In school, we were taught only a few people could be rich. Although we stood inside the U.S. pavilion in Montreal for hours, we did not get the answers we came for. All our brains could see was this massive structure, a sphere that seemed to hang in space, a massive dome with very little visible support. It was unlike any other building we had ever seen. The dome enclosed large volumes of space, yet it seemed as light as a feather. Although our brains did not get the answers we were looking for, our minds could sense the possibility of the world Fuller could see. Andy and I left Montreal with a profound sense of possibility, of the belief in the prospect of a world that could work for everyone, a world that didn't have to be a win-lose or you or me world. A world where we didn't have to kill or steal from others in order to live. A world that could be win-win, you and me. As many of you know, I believe that anyone can take control of their financial future if they are willing to learn, take action, make mistakes, learn from those mistakes and remain unstoppable. I've proven that a not-so-school-smart kid from Hilo, Hawaii could beat the odds, and I know you can, too. There can be a second chance for you, if you believe in yourself and are willing to put action behind the knowledge you gain. The generalized principle of the rich The generalized principle of the rich is the principle of ephemeralization. In the simplest of terms it means, to do more with less. The kings of the agrarian age became rich by doing more with less. Rather than move from place to place in search of food, they stopped moving in search of food and began producing food. By caring and cultivating the land, they could produce far more food from the land, feeding more and more people. The American robber barons of the industrial age followed the same principle of ephemeralization. They did more with less. Think back to John Stossel's words, on page 131, on why the robber barons were generous people. He is describing the generalized principle of ephemeralization. Q. So some people say the robber barons were greedy and others say they were generous. A. Yes. Again, all coins have three sides. Intelligence is being able to stand on the edge of the coin the edge of the idea or the issue and see both sides. Q. The new robber barons are entrepreneurs like Steve Jobs, Mark Zuckerberg, and David Karp. Did they follow the generalized principle of ephemeralization? A. Yes. Always remember, the horse was replaced by the horseless carriage. In the information age, humans are being replaced by technology they cannot see. Today, cyber real estate retailers such as Amazon and Alibaba are wiping out traditional real estate the retail stores, like Sears and J.C. Penney. In cities all over the world, millions are losing their jobs. Q, and that's why the gap between rich, poor, and middle class is growing? A, it's one of the reasons. Q, are you saying some people are operating by industrial age ideas and others are operating by information age ideas? A, yes. Many highly educated, unemployed executives are still looking for that high-paying job with benefits in the industrial age. Unfortunately, most schools and school teachers operate by industrial age ideas on business and employment. Most school teachers want more pay to teach smaller classes. This idea goes against the generalized principle of ephemeralization. They should, instead, be looking for ways they can do more, serve more kids, with better types of teaching, and better results, with less. Q. Aren't some teachers are using the internet to teach more students at lower prices? A. Yes. A few teachers are earning millions doing this as they should. 
these teachers are following the principle of ephemeralization. They are doing more with less. Q. What will happen to the teachers, or anyone, who does not follow the principle of ephemeralization? A. I'll let you can answer your own question. Personally, I believe the days are numbered for people who want to be paid more and do less. Many of the unemployed or underemployed continue to have that industrial age idea running their brain, which causes their mind to be blind to opportunities around them. Q. And our leaders have the same problem? They cannot see the changes. A. Yes, which is why the next crisis will be a quadrillion dollar crisis. The invisible giants some of the biggest markets in the world are, 1. The derivatives market 2. The currency market 3. The bond market 4. The stock market 5. The commodities market 6. The real estate market The three biggest markets are the top three, derivatives, currency, and bond markets, in that order. There is disagreement about where the other markets stocks, commodities, and real estate rank in terms of size. For me it's enough to know that they are all giant markets, and markets that overlap, which is why they're often difficult to measure. For example, many people invest in real estate via rights, real estate investment trusts, which are technically stocks. The same is true for commodities, stocks, and bonds. It can be confusing. The derivatives market The important point is, the biggest market in the world is the derivatives market. It dwarfs all other markets. It is the monster few people know about, understand or can see. Q. How big is it? A. Prior to the 2007 crash, the derivatives market was estimated to be $700 trillion. Q. Why is that important? A. Because the crash of 2007 was not really a real estate crash or stock market crash. It was a derivatives market crash. Q. So, what is a derivative? A. Before answering that question, I will quote comments from a few very knowledgeable experts on derivatives. Warren Buffett, the world's richest investor says, derivatives are financial weapons of mass destruction. George Soros, one of the most successful investors in the world, avoids using the financial contracts known as derivatives, because we don't really understand how they work. Felix Rahatan is the investment banker who saved New York from financial catastrophe in the 1970s. He describes derivatives as, financial hydrogen bombs. The other side of the coin not surprisingly, some people like derivatives. Former Fed Chairman Alan Greenspan, aka the maestro, who served four U.S. presidents, Reagan, Bush 41, Clinton, and Bush 43, had only good things to say about financial derivatives, concentrations of risk are more readily identified, and when such concentrations exceed the risk appetites of intermediaries, derivatives, and other credit and interest rate risk instruments can be employed to transfer the underlying risks to other entities. As a result, not only have individual financial institutions become less vulnerable to shocks from underlying risk factors, but also the financial system as a whole has become more resilient. Alan Greenspan in 2004 during confirmation hearings in 2005, as Ben Bernanke was poised to replace Alan Greenspan as the new Federal Reserve Chairman, the following Q&A took place, Senator Paul Sarbanes, Warren Buffett has warned us that derivatives are time bombs, both for the parties that deal in them and the economic system. The Financial Times has said so far, there has been no explosion, but the risks of this fast-growing market remain real. How do you respond to these concerns? Ben Bernanke, I am more sanguine about derivatives than the position you have just suggested. I think, generally speaking, they are very valuable. They provide methods by which risks can be shared, sliced, and diced, and given to those most willing to bear them. They add, I believe, to the flexibility of the financial system in many different ways. With respect to their safety, derivatives, for the most part, are traded among very sophisticated financial institutions and individuals who have considerable incentive to understand them and to use them properly. 
the Federal Reserve's responsibility is to make sure that the institutions it regulates have good systems and good procedures for ensuring that their derivatives portfolios are well managed and do not create excessive risk in their institutions. Fast forward to 2007. When the stock and real estate markets suddenly began collapsing in 2007, causing millions of families to lose their jobs, their homes, and their retirement investments, the problem was not really caused by subprime borrowers, bad real estate, or even fraudulent subprime debt. The real problem was derivatives known as CDs, credit default swaps, and CDOs, collateralized debt obligations. Warren Buffett spoke out saying, derivatives are, carrying dangers that, while now latent, are potentially lethal. When the subprime debt bomb exploded, derivatives were upgraded from latent to lethal. Derivatives were the invisible black death of the financial markets causing banking giants such as Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns to collapse, and millions to lose their jobs, homes, and futures. Q. What are derivatives? A. In extremely simple terms, derivatives are insurance policies, like the insurance policy you have on your home or your car. When subprime borrowers stopped paying on homes they could not afford, these weapons of mass destruction began exploding. The explosions were like Hurricane Katrina hitting New Orleans or Hurricane Sandy hitting New York and New Jersey. The difference is, insurance companies are regulated and have the resources to pay on claims. The derivatives market, the biggest financial market in the world, is largely unregulated and enforcement is virtually nil. It's the taxpayers who pay if derivatives go bad, not the banks or the people who sold and profited from the derivatives. The real robber barons the chairman of Federal Reserve Bank, the U.S. Secretary of the Treasury, and CEOs of our biggest banks could be viewed as the real robber barons. They used the generalized principle of ephemeralization to make themselves richer, at the expense of the world economy. They were greedy, not generous. And, in my opinion, they violated a generalized principle to rip people off, rather than use the principle to make life better. Today, the gap between the rich and everyone else continues to grow wider. Millions have lost everything, including their dreams. Tragically, only one banker has been prosecuted so far, while Greenspan and Bernanke enjoy their retirement and income from speaking fees. Q, who is responsible for this derivatives crisis? A. In the year 2000, President Bill Clinton signed a bill creating the Commodity Futures Modernization Act, the CFMA, which paved the way for a much larger derivatives market. Between 2000 and 2007, the derivative market grew from $100 trillion to $700 trillion. Then the explosions began. Q. How big is the derivatives market today? A. According to Bert Doman, publisher of the respected Wellington Letter, in 2014 the derivatives market had grown to $1.20 quadrillion. Q. How much is a quadrillion dollars? A. It's a s load of money. In the next chapter, I will go into other markets and government manipulation of markets, exploring what very few people know about or see. Q. Why would I want to know about that? A so you can have the time to get out of the way of things most people will never see coming. Part 2, The Present Introduction Are You Sane or Insane? Introduction Government Insanity Does it make sense that our governments continue to print money when printing money is what caused this crisis? Personal Insanity Does it make sense for you to keep working for money, saving money, and investing for the long term in the stock market when governments of the world are printing money just to keep the stock market propped up? Time to get sane. Part 2 of this book is about your present financial condition. Your second chance begins when you evaluate where you are today, and then decide where you want to be in the future. Part 3, The Future Introduction The best introduction to Part 3, in my opinion, is a summary of Parts 1 and 2. Does it make sense to go to school and learn little about money? Why would you go to school, to get a job? to work for money yet never learn about money. Education exerts a powerful influence in all our lives every day. 
That is why some types of education were denied to slaves prior to the Civil War and to women in many parts of the world even today. Chapter 1 of Rich Dad Poor Dad states, The rich don't work for money. The rich do not work for paychecks. As Rich Dad said, the person who signs the paycheck has tremendous power over the person who receives it. On top of that, the more money you earn, working for money, the more you'll pay in taxes. That may be why Steve Jobs' paycheck was only $1 a year. In addition to the fact that they learn little about money in school, many students leave school deeply in debt. Student loan debt is the most onerous of all types of debt. The chart below shows the rise in student loan debt. Image total consumer loans making matters worse, paychecks for college graduates are getting smaller. The chart below shows the drop in income for college graduates. Image still falling does it make sense to work hard for money, when the reward for working harder is only to pay more in taxes on the money you earn. The chart below shows that the higher income middle class pays the highest percentage in taxes. The top 20% pay 50% of their income in taxes, while the top 1% pay only 13%. This is one reason why the middle class is shrinking. Image who paid their fair share of taxes when you work for money, your wealth is stolen via taxes. Does it make sense to call your house an asset when it is really a liability? After 2007, millions of people found out the hard way that their homes were liabilities. Today, millions of people owe more on their homes than they're worth. Making matters worse, due to college loan debt, millions of young people are unable to even afford a home. The chart below shows the drop in home values. Your wealth is stolen via a lack of financial literacy, in this example, calling liabilities, assets. Does it make sense to get out of debt when the rich are using debt to get richer? Savers, on the left in the illustration on the previous page, save their after-tax dollars. The banking system's fractional reserve system reduces the purchasing power of their savings by multiplying the saver's money, lending to debtors with financial education, who will invest it, $10 for every dollar in savings. The fractional reserve system is the way money is printed. Every bank does it. Add this fact to the equation, interest on savings is taxed at the highest tax rates and, debt is tax-free. The carry trade in the world of large investors, there is a term known as the carry trade. It is how extremely large investors use debt to make money. For example, in 2014, Japan lowered its interest rates to near zero. Immediately giant investors, such as hedge funds, rushed to borrow billions in yen, converted the yen to dollars, and with those dollars purchased US Treasury bonds that paid a higher interest rate. In an overly simplified example, let's say a hedge fund, from anywhere in the world, borrows the equivalent of $1 billion US dollars in Japanese yen at 0% interest, converts the yen to $1 billion in US dollars, and buys a billion dollars worth of US bonds that pay 2%. The net result is that the hedge fund earns $20 million on the $1 billion in borrowed money. This is known as the carry trade symbolized by the wheelbarrow in the illustration on the previous page. Borrowing yen to buy US bonds causes, the US dollar to grow stronger because people are buying dollars to invest in bonds, bond prices to go up, interest rates to fall, US exports to become more expensive causing people to buy more Japanese products because Japanese products are cheaper, unemployment to rise in America, gold and silver prices to come down, and life becomes more difficult for the poor and middle class everywhere. Obviously, if Japan raises its interest rates, the world would go into chaos, as it did in 2007. Keeping it simple in an even more overly simplified example, it would be like you borrowing $1 million from one bank, paying 0% interest on the loan, and then carrying the money across town where you deposited that $1 million in a bank that paid you 5% interest. You would earn $50,000 on the interest-free loan, on the $1 million you borrowed. If the bank that was charging you 0% interest suddenly raised its interest rate to 10% on the $1 million you borrowed, you would be in serious financial trouble. 
you would have to pay $100,000 in interest, eating up the $50,000 you earned in interest, at 5%, and costing you $50,000 loss. This is what causes economic panics and crashes. The biggest banks don't care if they lose billions because the government always seems to step in to bail them out if they make mistakes. They use the excuse that the big banks are too big to fail. You and I would probably have to declare bankruptcy. The rich have the power to bail out their banks. In today's world, if the banks make money, they win. If the banks lose money, you and I lose. This is why Bucky Fuller said, they're playing games with our money. This is one example of how our wealth is stolen via our money, via what Fuller called grunge, the gross universal cash heist. Your wealth is stolen via your savings. Does it make sense to save money when the government is printing money? When banks print money, inflation goes up. Keep in mind, governments do include food and fuel prices in the inflation numbers. In 1929, after the Great Crash the United States did not print money, so it went into the Great Depression. In 1918, the German Weimar government did print money and Germany went into the Great Inflation. The chart below shows what happened in Germany. Today, America appears to be following the 1918 to 1923 Germans into hyperinflation. The chart below is proof how the Fed, Wall Street and President Reagan's plunge protection team, keeps goosing the Dow, preventing it from crashing. Does it make sense to invest for the long term, when the stock markets are at all-time highs and professional investors are using HFT, high-frequency trading, to invest for the short term using computers to buy and sell stocks thousands of times every second? In Rich Dad's Prophecy, published in 2002, Rich Dad predicted that a giant crash would occur around 2016. That book also predicted an earlier crash that would occur prior to 2016, and that was the crash of 2007. When you look at the chart above it seems likely that Rich Dad's prophecy might come true. Let's hope not. And, as everyone knows, things go up and things come down. So why would you invest for the long term when the stock market is at all-time highs? If Rich Dad and Bucky Fuller are correct, those in the stock market could be hit the hardest. It's what Chris Martinson, in his book The Crash Course, calls tertiary wealth. Your wealth is being stolen by investing for the long term in tertiary wealth, paper assets like stocks, bonds, mutual funds, and savings. During this economic era, I'd be very suspicious of anything that's printed on paper. For those of you who invest in tertiary assets, I encourage you to research Bert Doman and his Wellington letter. I have found that his is the most accurate forecaster of the markets and has been for more than 30 years. What is financial education? If cash is trash, financial education is the opposite of traditional education taught in schools. Part 3 of this book is about the other side of the coin, the duality, the yin and yang of financial education. Part 3 is not about being right or wrong. Financial intelligence is standing on the edge of a coin looking at both sides of the coin, the heads and the tails and then deciding what is best for you. Chapter 9 The opposite of go to school integrity is the essence of everything successful. R. Buckminster Fuller in 1973, I returned to Hawaii from Vietnam. I was stationed at the Marine Corps Air Station at Kaneohe, Hawaii. At the time I had another year and a half left on my contract with the Marine Corps. I went to both dads, asking for ideas on what I should do next. I loved flying, I loved the Marines, but the war was over and it was time for me to move on. My poor dad suggested I go back to school, get my MBA and, possibly, a doctorate degree. My rich dad suggested I take seminars on real estate investing. This is an example of opposites in education. Pictured on the following page is a financial statement to illustrate the differences. My poor dad recommended that I go back to school so I could get a high-paying job and a steady paycheck in corporate America. He was recommending that I work for money in the income column. My rich dad was recommending I learn to use debt to acquire tax-free cash flow from assets. 
Taking the suggestions of both dads, I signed up for the MBA program at the University of Hawaii and a three-day real estate investment seminar. After completing my real estate seminar and buying my first cash flow producing asset, I dropped out of the MBA program. I was 26 years old and beginning to understand the differences between a paycheck and cash flow, debt, and taxes. Q, what are the differences between, one being an employee, with the MBA climbing a corporate ladder, working for paychecks, bonuses, and a retirement portfolio filled with paper assets. Two being an entrepreneur, building businesses, and investing in the real estate, working to create assets that produce cash flow. A there are many differences. A few are, one retire young Kim was 37 and I was 47 when we achieved financial freedom. As stated earlier, I was over $800,000 in debt from losses from my nylon wallet business when Kim and I took our leap of faith in 1984. Yet we were financially free by 1994. I doubt if we would have achieved what we did, if not for what I learned from a three-day real estate seminar. In 10 years, we had built a financial education business as entrepreneurs, paid off most of my past debt, and acquired enough cash flow from real estate investments to be financially free. My book Retire Young Retire Rich is an account of our 10-year process. Two debt and taxes the primary advantages of real estate over paper assets tertiary wealth such as stocks, bonds, mutual funds, and savings is the power of debt and taxes. Simply put, Debt and taxes make you poorer if you invest in paper assets. Debt and taxes can make you richer, if you are a professional investor in real estate. 3. Financial stability Whenever I talk to groups about the coming stock market crash, I can tell immediately who is in the stock market. I can see whose financial future is dependent upon the health of the stock market. If someone in the group asks me why I am not worried, I remind them that much of my wealth is in real estate. When I am asked why my real estate will not go down in a crash, I remind them that my real estate holdings are always near jobs, jobs that are not affected by stock market crashes. For example, most of our apartment complexes are in major oil industrial cities like Houston and Oklahoma City, or next to hospitals, colleges, and large insurance companies. The price of oil may go up and down, but cash flow from renters keeps flowing. I remind them of what happened to real estate in cities like Detroit, when the auto industry collapsed. Detroit real estate crashed with the auto industry. Today in Detroit, vacant homes are being torn down. So much for the flawed assumption that a house is an asset. The lesson is real estate is only as good as the jobs near the property. If the financial services industry collapses, High-priced real estate in cities like New York, London, Shanghai, and Tokyo, will suffer. Most people need a roof over their heads. If they cannot afford the money for rent, the government often subsidizes the rent money. These are some of the reasons why some real estate is less affected by market crashes. And only some of the things I learned in my three-day real estate investment seminar in 1973. If I had continued on with my MBA, and found a high-paying corporate job, I would probably be a struggling, middle management executive today, worried about losing my job to younger and more tech-savvy workers who are willing to work for less, and living in fear of a stock market crash that would wipe out my retirement. Instead, every time the stock and real estate markets crash, as they did in 2007, I grow richer buying more real estate assets with debt, increasing my cash flow, and paying less in taxes. Those are some of the advantages of seeing the opposite side to education. Lesson from Fuller During one of his talks, Fuller spoke on the word integrity. His definition was that things with integrity held their shape. He then said, a triangle was the minimum shape that had integrity. As he spoke, I better understood why my rich dad was richer than my poor dad, even though my poor dad held a PhD. The following is my interpretation of Fuller's talk on integrity applied to education. College kids, many students leave school unprepared for the real world due to a lack of professional education. Many have to go back to school to gain professional education. Poor dad, 
my poor dad had only two of the three points of the triangle. My poor dad was academically gifted and trained professionally as a teacher. But without financial education, money literally slipped through his hands. Rich dad, my rich dad had all three types of education. Rather than go to college, rich dad attended two to four business and investment, weekend seminars a year. Rather than go on for my MBA, in 1973, I followed in my rich dad's educational path. In 1996, after Kim and I were financially free, the rich dad company was founded to provide seminars, educational products, coaching, and mentorship programs on entrepreneurship and investing for people who want financial freedom more than job security. Lesson for your second chance if you go back to school, know the difference between a paycheck and cash flow. They are opposites when it comes to education. Financial education is the opposite side of the coin when you go to school you learn to work for money. Financial education teaches you to acquire assets that produce cash flow. Chapter 10 The opposite of don't make mistakes mistakes are sins, only when not admitted. R. Buckminster Fuller at the end of my three-day real estate seminar, in 1973, the instructor said, now your education begins. This puzzled the class. We thought the three days in the seminar was our education. As the seminar ended, the instructor who was a real, real estate investor with passive income, not a teacher working for a paycheck broke the class of 30 or 40 people into groups. Our assignment was to look at, evaluate, and write a short report on 100 investment properties in the next 90 days. I was in a group of four. All four of us agreed to get together for 90 days to complete the assignment. As you might have guessed, by the end of the 90 days only two of us were left. The other two were too busy working for a paycheck to complete the assignment. They did not have time to look for assets. This 90-day process was the most important 90 days in my financial life. Those 90 days transformed me from a poor person into a rich person. Pictured on the next page is a diagram called the Cone of Learning, developed by educational psychologist Edgar Dale. Please take a moment to study it. For 90 days, the instructor had us focused on the second section of the Cone of Learning, simulating the real experience. For 90 days we did not buy anything. Initially our little group of four would meet in the afternoon, go through property listings, looking for properties that met the criteria we learned in class. Then we'd make calls to real estate agents, setting up appointments to see the properties, often three to five a day. At the end of the day, we would write up our summaries on a single page in a spiral notebook our findings, the pros and cons, the good, the bad, and the opportunity. It was a painful, tedious, and slow process at first. We felt like babies learning to walk, by the end of the first month, two of our team had dropped out. They grew tired of not finding anything worth buying. One of the things that discouraged us was real estate brokers who continually said, what you're looking for doesn't exist in Hawaii. They'd often follow that statement with, real estate in Hawaii is expensive. You cannot find low-priced properties that produce positive cash flow here. As Rich Dad often said, the reason they are real estate brokers is because they are broker than you. What he meant is that most employees and self-employed individuals work for money. In the case of real estate agents, they work for commissions. As real estate investors, on the business owner and professional investor side of the quadrant, we were looking for assets that produced cash flow. Knowing the difference in mindsets between ES and SS and BS and IS kept me going. By the end of the second month, we were flying. We were still not finding anything, but our minds could see slight distinctions, subtle differences, things we had not seen before. We were beginning to see the invisible. At the end of 90 days, I thanked my partner and we went our separate ways. Of the 100 properties we evaluated, we had identified only 5 properties that had potential. He knew which ones he was going to pursue and so did I. Just as our instructor said, out of 100 properties, 
you might be lucky to find one hot property. He said, the purpose of the three-day course and the 90-day process was to teach us how to go through the 99 bad properties faster and faster, to find that one great property. My first investment property was a one-bedroom slash one-bath condo, across the street from a beautiful white sand beach in a small village near Lahaina, Maui, which is some of the most expensive real estate in Hawaii. It was not luxury real estate, it was housing for employees who worked in the luxury hotels in Lahaina. The price of the property was $18,000, an incredibly low price. It was one of those properties the real estate agents said did not exist. Comparable units in the area were going for $26,000. The seller was the developer of the condo project and did not want to pay real estate agents a commission. Consequently, the agents, who work for those commissions, had no incentive to tell me about the project. I stumbled across it by accident. The seller had 12 condos he wanted to sell quickly. He asked that I put 10% down and told me that he would finance the rest. I did not have to go to a bank for a mortgage which was good because my credit was bad and I did not earn much money. I used my credit card to finance my down payment of $1,800. After all expenses were paid, I netted $25 a month in positive cash flow. Now I can hear some of you saying, those deals don't exist anymore. Real estate prices are much higher today. That is exactly what our instructor, in 1973, said people would say. He said, most people are so busy working for a paycheck they do not have time to get rich. He said, it is easier to say these deals don't exist than go out and look at 100 properties in 90 days to find one. He also said, the deal of a lifetime comes along every day. And I know that to be a true statement. Some of the best investments Kim and I have found were sitting right in front of us. We never would have found them if we weren't looking for them. Kim found her best investment right across the street from where we live in Phoenix. It was the investment that transformed her into a rich woman. She would never have seen it the good deal if she had not looked at thousands of bad deals. In Chapter 7 of this book, I wrote about my friend Graham, in Scotland, who found a 150-year-old church that the government gave him the money to purchase and refurbish. For over four years, people in the neighborhood walked right by the giant for sale sign in front of the church on their way to work, never stopping to look for an asset. They were too busy looking for a paycheck. In 1973, that first real estate deal blew my mind, I had acquired an asset that produced $25 per month and didn't use a dime of my own money to do it. I had just experienced how to use debt to become richer. I went back and purchased two more of those same units. I was crossing over to the other side of the coin. I had crossed the line from poor and middle class into the world of the rich. Just as the instructor had said, I would never have to say, I can't afford it ever again. Today, Kim and I own several thousand cash flowing apartment properties, commercial properties, a luxury hotel, a boutique hotel, five golf courses, and oil wells. Every year we add more assets like those to our financial statement and pay less in taxes. If the stock, real estate, and oil markets crash again, which they will because all markets crash, we will acquire more assets at even lower prices, using the power of debt and taxes to increase our cash flow. Q, don't you feel sorry for people who cannot see what you see? A, yes and no because we all have equal opportunity. Anyone can do what the rich do, if they want to do it. The same tax laws the rich use are available for everyone to use, but only if they have financial education and real-life financial experience. The real problem is our choices in education, choices which blind us from seeing the opposite side of money. The reason I write, create games, and teach is to give others the same opportunities my rich dad gave me. Everywhere I go in the world, people always say, you can't do that here. Even when I speak in cities like Phoenix, cities where I am doing what they say cannot be done. The reason they can't do what I do where they live is because they were taught to work for money, job security, and a paycheck. 
those words blind them and prevent them from seeing the opposite side of the coin. The power of mistakes Another reason why so few people see the other side, or other points of view, is because our schools punish students for making mistakes. The question is, how can anyone learn anything if they're afraid of making mistakes? When you watch a baby learning to walk, you'll see them stand and fall and cry. After a while, they'll try again, standing, falling, and crying. They repeat the process until they stand, walk, then run. Their next challenge is to learn to ride a bicycle. The process of learning continues. Again, the child falls off the bicycle until they learn to ride. Their world expands with the more mistakes they make. Then they go to school. In school they learn that students who memorize the right answers are smart. Students who make mistakes are stupid. Then they get a job, where they are fired if they make mistakes. In other words, once a child goes to school, their learning process becomes retarded. At the age of five, they begin to learn to fear and avoid making mistakes. When I talk about becoming an entrepreneur and starting a business, or investing in real estate, the first thoughts that cross the mind of most employees are, what if I make a mistake? What if I lose money? What if I fail? This is why most people are not rich. They have learned to fear making mistakes. They are taught that only stupid people make mistakes. They are taught not to make mistakes, rather than how to learn from their mistakes. Failing to succeed if you look at the real world, the world outside the school system, you'll see that the biggest failures are the biggest winners. For example, Thomas Edison failed over a thousand times, before inventing the electric light bulb and going on to found General Electric. In his book Outliers, Malcolm Gladwell writes that few rock bands have ever failed more than the Beatles. He writes that as teenagers, they performed up to 12 hours a day, every day, for free beer and an audience of pretty women. Tiger Woods started playing golf at the age of three. After school, he would practice at a local golf course until it was too dark to see the balls he was hitting. If you'll look again at the cone of learning you will understand why failure leads to success. The line just below doing the real thing is the most important line on the cone of learning. The learning through simulation separates winners from losers. Opposite, mistakes the difference between my MBA program and the three-day real estate seminar was that second line simulating the real experience. The entire time I was in night school, working toward my MBA, there was always an underlying theme of do not make mistakes. The reason to study hard in school was so that I would not make mistakes once I got a job. This was in sharp contrast to my instructor for my three-day real estate course. He encouraged us, emphatically pleading with us, to immediately begin making mistakes. That's why he said that our education began when we left his class. After making 100 mistakes in 90 days, then, and only then, did he recommend moving up to the top line on the cone of leaning doing the real thing. That meant buying something. After doing the real thing, making $25 a month in cash flow using 100% debt, I dropped out of the MBA program. I did not want to work for job security and a paycheck, and I did not want to live my life in fear of losing my job if I made a mistake. Playing cash flow Many people think I am giving them a sales pitch when I suggest that they play the cash flow game at least 100 times and then teach 100 people how to play the game. Many think that I only want their money. While sales are important to the rich dad company, my primary reason for recommending that people play our cash flow game at least 100 times and teach 100 people is because that is how my rich dad taught his son and me. Starting at the age of 9, while playing Monopoly registered over and over again, he passed on words of wisdom as his son and I made mistake after mistake playing the game. Like my rich dad and my real estate instructor, I too encourage people to make as many mistakes as they can before doing the real thing, and using real money. Rich dad advisor Darren Weeks followed my advice and began teaching people to play cash flow. So far, he has taught over 100,000 people, across Canada, the United States, and Europe to play the cash flow game and has become a multi-millionaire in the process. 
he simply did in real life what he learned from playing and teaching the game, which is to acquire assets that produce cash flow. Q. So making mistakes and learning from our mistakes is the key to success. A. It is. In the real world it is called practice. For example, professional football teams practice five days a week, then play only one day. This is why doctors and lawyers called their business a practice, rather than a business. In music and the theater, practice is called a rehearsal. Q. So practices and rehearsals are where professionals make mistakes and learn from their mistakes, before doing the real thing? A. Yes. In 2014, I was at the Ryder Cup in Scotland, watching some of the best golfers in the world play for the United States and European teams. They spent the day before the matches practicing, on the practice tee and playing practice rounds, and before they hit at the ball off the tee, they always took two or three practice swings, before doing the real thing. That's why they are winners in the game of golf. Winners make more mistakes than amateurs. Bucky Fuller on Mistakes Fuller had this to say about mistakes, human beings were given a left foot and a right foot to make a mistake first to the left then to the right again, and repeat. My sketch on the following page puts Bucky's words into a picture. In an article entitled Mistake Mystique Fuller writes, it is only at the moment of humans' realistic admission to selves of having made a mistake that they are closest to that mysterious integrity governing the universe. In other words, the moment a person admits to making a mistake, they come closer to God. Fuller states, mistakes are sins only when not admitted. In other words we sin when we omit something and are closer to God when we admit something. And when we admit to making a mistake, Fuller says, only then are humans able to free themselves from the misconceptions that brought about their mistakes. In other words, God designed humans to learn by making mistakes. In Mistake Mystique, Fuller states, at present, teachers, professors, and their helpers go over the student's examination, looking for errors. They usually ratio the percentage of error to the percentage of correctly remembered concepts to which students have been exposed. I suggest that the teaching world alter this practice and adopt the requirements that all students periodically submit a written account of all the mistakes they have made, not only regarding the course subject but in their self-discipline, during the term, which also recording what they have learned from the recognition that they have made the mistakes, the report should summarize what it is they have really learned, not only in their courses, out on their own intuition, and initiative. I suggest then that the faculty be marked as well as the students on a basis of their effectiveness in helping students learn about any subject doing so by nature's prescribed trial and error leverage. The more mistakes the students discover, the higher their grade. This is exactly the process my real estate instructor had us go through. We wrote down what we learned from our mistakes, not our successes. I am convinced this is one reason why I have made so much money with minimal losses, from my real estate investments. Again, learning in the real world is opposite from learning in school. Lesson for your second chance in school, the person who makes the fewest mistakes wins. In real life, the person who makes the most mistakes wins. Financial education is. The opposite side of the coin find a place you can practice, practice, and practice, making mistake after mistake. Remember, the most successful people make the most mistakes. Chapter 11 The opposite of get good grades I would say, then, that you are faced with a future in which education is going to be number one amongst the great world industries. Our Buckminster Fuller education is a very big word. Education is more important today than ever before. For billions of people, the answer to today's economic crisis is, go back to school. The question is, is that the best answer for you? Will traditional education give you your second chance in life? As Fuller predicted, education is going to be number one among the great world industries. But the question is, what kind of education? Will it be the same education you went experienced in school? Will it be students sitting in a room listening to a teacher, memorizing answers, and taking tests? Will it be online learning? 
or will it be a radically different educational process? I believe it will be the latter. If education is going to be the world's great industry, it cannot remain in its present state, controlled by the government and labor unions. Someday soon, a new educational process will emerge, and we will look back at children sitting in classrooms, listening to teachers, memorizing answers, taking tests, and say, how barbaric. How did anyone learn anything? The chart below speaks to a disturbing trend. It shows that unemployment is rising for jobless workers with some college education. Will going back to school change their lives for the better? Threat to national security retired four-star Admiral Mike Mullen, former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, states that the top two biggest threats to national security are, one the national debt to K-12 education Admiral Mullen's concern for the national debt is reflected in the following chart, the Admiral's concern for K-12 education is reflected in the following are statistics. 1. After World War II, the United States had the number one high school graduation rate in the world. Today, the United States has dropped to number 22 among the 27 industrialized nations. 2. Less than half 46% finish college. This ranks the United States dead last, at 18 out of 18 industrialized countries. Three two-thirds of college professors report that what is taught in high school does not prepare students for college. Q. Does college prepare you for the real world? A. It depends upon how you define the real world, and what you want in life. Again, the cash flow quadrant below shows the four different worlds in the world of money. Traditional education high school, trade schools, colleges, and graduate schools prepare students for the ENS side of the quadrant, my poor dad's side. Those on the left side of the quadrant work for money. Traditional education does not prepare students for the B&I quadrants, my rich dad's side where people work to acquire assets and cash flow. For your second chance in the world of money, you will need to decide which quadrants are best for you. The good news is that on the right side, the B and I side of the quadrant, you can learn by using your stronger intelligence. Q. There are different intelligences. A. Yes, there are many different types of intelligences. Unfortunately, our educational system emphasizes and focuses primarily on two intelligences, verbal linguistic intelligence and logical mathematical. Simply put, if you are good at reading and writing and enjoy math, you will do well in school. If you are not blessed with these two intelligences, good luck. Q. Who discovered the different intelligences? A. Professor Howard Gardner of Harvard University, and he wrote about them in his 1983 book, Frames of Mind. In that book, he identified seven different intelligences. They are, one verbal linguistic intelligence, they learn by reading and listening. They think in words. They enjoy word games, word puzzles, writing poetry and stories. Two logical mathematical intelligence, they think conceptually, abstractly, and are able to explore patterns and relationships. Three body kinesthetic intelligence, these people often become athletes, dancers, and surgeons. They learn by body activity. Four visual spatial intelligence, they think in terms of physical space, as do architects, artists, and sailors. Very aware of their environments. They like to draw and daydream. 5. Musical intelligence, person shows sensitivity to rhythm and sound. They love music. Often study better with music in background. 6. Interpersonal intelligence, ability to interact with others. Great communicators, who learn through interaction with others. They have many friends, empathy for others, and are street smart. 7. Intrapersonal intelligence, communicate with self, understanding one's own interests and goals. They tend to shy away from others. They're in tune with their own feelings, have wisdom, intuition, motivation, and a strong will. Very independent learners. Gardner has gone on to identify many more intelligences. He recognizes that these different intelligences make it difficult for our one-size-fits-all education to support different students. 
This is why so many students learn to hate school, even though they love learning. For example, I did not like reading, writing, or math, but I loved surfing and playing football, which I practiced for hours. I went to the military academy because learning was first physical. I was graded on how well I could design and sail large ships. I did well in flight school, again because learning to fly was physical. You cannot learn to fly a plane by reading a book. The math and science was extremely difficult for me and, if not for physical learning, I would never have received a college degree. As an adult, I love real estate investing because it is investing in things I can see, touch, and feel. I do not care for stocks, bonds, and mutual funds because paper asset investing is primarily for those who are good at reading and math. Entrepreneurs must be strong in interpersonal intelligence, communicating with many different people from different professions. The most important intelligence for entrepreneurs is intrapersonal intelligence, the ability to handle risk, financial losses, going without a paycheck for long periods of time, being responsible for personal mistakes and mistakes of employees, and constant emotional stress. The question is, what is your strongest intelligence? What are your second and third strongest intelligences? The differences in intelligences is what causes us to be different people. And those differences account for why some people are better suited to operate in certain quadrants. For example, if you are not strong with intrapersonal intelligence, it is best you stay in the E quadrant. Education for human beings One problem with our current educational system is that it is industrial age education. Students are treated like robots being assembled on an assembly line by other robots. All robots learn on a schedule designed by other robots. If a robot cannot keep up with the assembly line curriculum, it's sent back to the start of the line and labeled retarded, slow, or with a disease created by teachers, a disease called ad or attention deficit disorder. In reality, extreme boredom. The problem is we are human beings. We are not robots. All human beings are different. In a family of four kids, all four children will be very different. Even identical twins are different. Before you find your second chance, it is important for you to respect your unique intelligence, your strengths, and your weaknesses. Just because you were not born rich, did not do well in school, or do not do well climbing the corporate ladder for bigger paychecks, does not mean you cannot find wealth, freedom, and happiness. This is why the following section on education for human beings, not robots, is important for your second chance in life. The tetrahedron Fuller taught us that the tetrahedron, pictured below, was the minimum structure in the universe. The tetrahedron was different from a triangle because a tetrahedron defined a volume and a triangle defined an area. Since humans have volume, I will use the tetrahedron to represent human intelligence and what makes us human beings. Different intelligences I have been teaching professionally since 1984. The more I taught, the more I realized humans had four different intelligences. The four intelligences of a human being are, one physical intelligence, great athletes are gifted physical learners. Physical intelligence is found in the muscles. Golfers will say you need to develop muscle memory. Two mental intelligence, most people who do well in school are gifted mental learners. Mental intelligence is found in the brain. People will say, let me think about it. Three emotional intelligence, emotional intelligence is known as the success intelligence. That means the higher a person's emotional intelligence, the better they are at handling life's challenges. Challenges such as fear, loss, anger, and boredom. Emotional intelligence is located in the stomach, in our gut. For spiritual intelligence, spiritual intelligence is found in the heart. Artists, poets, religious leaders, are gifted with spiritual intelligence. Q. Why is physical intelligence on top? A. Because all learning is physical, even reading, thinking, and writing are physical. As Albert Einstein said, nothing happens until something moves. Q. Why is spiritual intelligence on the bottom? A. 
because spiritual intelligence is the most powerful of all the intelligences. The higher a person's spiritual intelligence, the kinder and more generous they are. The lower their spiritual intelligence, the meaner, greedier, and, often, corrupt the person. Many people sacrifice their spiritual intelligence when they lie, cheat, and steal. As you know, there are people who will sell their souls for money. Many people sell their soul working in a business that kills their spirit. A few people will even kill a family member for money. I believe this financial crisis is a primarily spiritual crisis. There is too much greed, crime, and corruption running the world. This is why strengthening the four intelligences that make you a human being, is important, especially if you want a second chance in life. Q. How do I strengthen my different intelligences? A. You can strengthen your intelligences by changing your environments. For example, going to the gym can strengthen your physical intelligence. Your physical intelligence is also strengthened when you learn new business skills such as learning to sell or taking a painting class. Going to a library, sitting quietly to read, and study can strengthen your mental intelligence. Taking an investment class, which is especially important if you are afraid of losing money, can strengthen your mental intelligence. Q. Even emotional intelligence. A. Yes. Emotional intelligence may be the most important intelligence for those serious about a second chance. Gardner called emotional intelligence intrapersonal intelligence. Some people call it the success intelligence. If a person cannot learn to control their emotions they may never achieve their dreams in life. Q. Can you give me some examples? A. Sure. There are many people who are very smart mentally, but are weak emotionally. For example, many school teachers are gifted with mental intelligence, but emotions, such as the fear of failing, often hold them back financially. Another example of emotional intelligence is called delayed gratification. Many people want to get rich quick. Working to get rich quick is a sign of low emotional intelligence. Those people cannot delay gratification. I have a friend who invests in real estate. His problem is that, Rather than be happy with steady cash flow, he sells his property, for capital gains and pays taxes on those gains, the moment real estate prices go up. Selling for capital gains is killing the goose that is laying golden eggs. Q. How do I strengthen my emotional intelligence? A. Hire a coach. All professional athletes have coaches. Most successful people have coaches. I have met many great coaches and they have enhanced my life greatly. The job of a coach is to bring out the best in you. If you cannot afford a coach, find a friend who will be your coach, holding you accountable for doing what you know you need to do. I also have emotional coaches, often called therapists, someone you can talk to about your deepest and darkest doubts and fears. Many people stuff or suppress their emotions. For example, a friend of mine lost their son. Rather than seek professional help, she toughed it out. She buried their emotions. The problem with stuffing down emotions is that it takes energy to keep emotions down, to hold them in. If the emotion is released, a person has more energy for productive things. Stuffed emotions often lead to disease. This friend of mine was later diagnosed with cancer. I do not know if there is a relationship between emotions and disease, but I suspect there is. Rich Dad advisors Josh and Lisa Lannan, are social entrepreneurs. They build clinics that work with people who have drug and alcohol addictions. Their new venture is working with veterans, servicemen, and women who return with emotional damage from serving in war zones. They state that most addictions and mental problems stem from emotional problems. What is faith? Emotional and spiritual intelligence is essential to faith. Faith is vital for your second chance. Bucky Fuller said, faith is much better than belief. Belief is when someone else does the thinking. When Kim and I set off on our journey, our leap of faith in 1984, all we had was our faith in ourselves and faith that if we did the right things, things would work out. One facet to our faith was that we would get smarter along the way. 
we had faith that our intelligences would grow, even though neither Kim nor I were not rocket scientists in school. We both have our college degrees, but what we learned along the way we did not learn in school. What kept us going was faith and emotional intelligence, not academic intelligence. We delayed gratification by going for long periods without paychecks. And even though cash was tight, we kept investing with debt and creative financing, never flipping our properties, even though we could have used the money. Rather than flip our properties for quick cash, and higher taxes, we worked harder in our business to produce more cash flow. By delaying gratification, we became better entrepreneurs and investors because we did not have very much money. In other words, adversity made us smarter. Lesson from Bucky Fuller One of my favorite quotes from Fuller is, God is a verb, not a noun. That is why I put physical intelligence at the top of the tetrahedron and spiritual intelligence at the base. For you to find your genius especially if you did not do well in school you have to do something, make mistakes, and learn. That is the way you find the faith to discover your true, God-given intelligence, your unique genius. Fuller's suggestion for your second chance is, the things to do are, the things that need doing, that you see need to be done, and that no one else seems to see need to be done. Then you will conceive your own way of doing that which needs to be done that no one else has told you to do or how to do it. This will bring out the real you that often gets buried inside a character that has acquired a superficial array of behaviors induced or imposed by others on the individual. Your unique intelligence, your true genius, will emerge when you start doing things, because you are doing what you believe needs to be done, without anyone telling you how to do it. That is what Kim and I did in 1984. We had no qualifications to be teachers. We were only doing what we saw needed to be done, which was to provide financial education for everyone and anyone who wants to learn. Lesson for your second chance Evaluate the four intelligences of your tetrahedron. Use a rating system of 1 to 10, with 10 being the highest. 1. How strong is your physical intelligence? 2. How strong is your mental intelligence? 3. How strong is your emotional intelligence? 4. How strong is your spiritual intelligence? If you score yourself over 30, you have a pretty good chance for a second chance in your financial life. If you score yourself below 30, find a friend you trust and talk over your strengths and weaknesses. Your second chance will require that you develop and use all four of your intelligences. Financial education is. The opposite side of the coin talking over your intelligences could be the best thing you can do. Admitting your weaknesses is the first step in gaining strengths. Again, everything is opposite. Chapter 12 The opposite of get a good job over specialization leads to extinction. Our Buckminster Fuller when I was in school, everyone wanted to climb the corporate ladder. My classmates wanted to be VPS of XYZ Corp or sales managers at ABC Corp. They wanted to be high paid employees. Today, everyone wants to be an entrepreneur. With high unemployment, technology replacing people in the workforce, global competition, and less job security, people dream of being their own boss, starting their own business, and enjoying a life of financial freedom. Today we have high school kids and college dropouts who are billionaires and it's because they're entrepreneurs, not employees. Today, we live in a startup world. Many colleges and universities have incubators nurtured with the hope of launching the next Google or Facebook. The fact that millions of people are becoming entrepreneurs is a good thing. Entrepreneurs have the power to save the economy. Unfortunately, statistics show that 9 out of 10 new businesses will be out of business in 5 years. The reason most new businesses fail is because traditional education trains students to be specialists. And entrepreneurs are generalists. 9 out of 10 new businesses fail because the entrepreneur is too specialized. They do not have the generalized business skills to survive. Q. What are the differences between specialists and generalists? A. A specialist knows a lot about a little. A generalist knows a little about a lot. Q. So why do specialists fail? A. They lack the business skills required to be entrepreneurs, 
skills that are usually not taught in school. Q. Name a skill not taught in school. A. Entrepreneurs must be able to sell. If an entrepreneur cannot sell, they don't eat. The reason so many people do not quit their jobs is because they cannot outsell their paycheck. Q. What do you mean by that? What do you mean they cannot outsell their paycheck? A. Let's say a person earns $10,000 a month via paycheck. If they become an entrepreneur, they have to bring in at least $50,000 in sales. Q. Why $50,000 in sales? A. It's just a rule of thumb, an approximate 5 to 1 ratio. For every dollar you earned as an employee, you have to bring in at least 5 times that as an entrepreneur to feed yourself and feed the business. When you become an entrepreneur, you have expenses employees don't have. You have product costs, equipment costs, costs of doing business, taxes, professional services, and on and on. When you hire your first employee, your costs, risks, and headaches go up. Studies show that most entrepreneurs earn less than their employees when the number of hours they actually work are calculated. For example, many entrepreneurs go to work after the business is closed for the day. The paperwork from compliance with government regulations, bookkeeping, taxes, payroll, and marketing and sales support is staggering. The employee goes home and enjoys life, but for the entrepreneur the day is just beginning. This is one reason why the vast majority of businesses fail in the first five years. Q. So what can I do? A. Keep your full-time job and start a part-time business. Every employee at Rich Dad is encouraged to have a part-time, incubator business. We do not want them to leave, yet we want them to one day be a financially free human being. Many are close to replacing their paychecks with cash flow from their part-time business or their investments. Hopefully they will stay and work with the Rich Dad company, even if they're financially free, just because they like working there and enjoy the opportunities to learn and study together. Q. So your employees are specialists, learning to be generalists in their spare time. Is that what you're saying? A. Yes. When people go back to school, they become more specialized. They learn computer programming, auto repair, a foreign language, or get their master's degree. They learn a lot about a little, meaning a very narrow and specialized education. Q. So how does a person become a generalist? What do they study? A. The BI triangle sums it up. It illustrates the eight integrities of a business and their relationship to each other. Q. What is the BI triangle? What does it represent? A. The BI triangle is what an asset looks like. Q. The BI triangle is a diagram of an asset. A. Yes. As you can see the BI triangle is made up of the eight components that I call integrities because they're essential to success. Collectively, they keep a business, the asset, whole, complete, functioning, and producing cash flow. That's the bottom line. Q. So, if one of the eight integrities is weak or missing, the business will fail or struggle financially. A. Exactly. Whenever I talk with a struggling entrepreneur, the eight integrities of the BI triangle serve as a checklist a simple diagnostic guide to discover what is missing or what is out of integrity. Q. So schools train students to be specialists working within one of the integrities of the BI triangle? A. Yes. And to be an entrepreneur, you need to be a generalist, knowing a little about each of them. And knowing when and where you need specialists. Q. But the product, or P is the smallest section. Does that mean the product is least important? A. It does. Product alone is of little value. So many people rush around saying, I have a great idea for a new product. Another reason that 9 out of 10 new businesses fail is because they focus on the product, not the whole business. Q. When a new entrepreneur starts a business, are they the entire BI triangle? A. Yes. They are responsible for all 8 integrities. They start as specialists in the S quadrant. Very few make it to the B quadrant. Q. 
Q, why is that? A, each quadrant represents a different mindset. Very few small entrepreneurs have the mindset of giant entrepreneurs such as Steve Jobs. Q, so for an S quadrant entrepreneur to grow he or she must hire employees who are smarter and more specialized than they are for every one of the integrities. A, yes, the entrepreneur hires specialists. For example, the first specialist an entrepreneur must hire is a bookkeeper, someone who will keep accurate records of income and expenses. Many entrepreneurs find themselves in serious trouble in less than a year because they did not keep good records. For the entrepreneur to grow into a B-quadrant business, it's often necessary to hire a CEO to run the company. Q. What about entrepreneurs who do their own books? A. It keeps them small. If you do your own books, you will probably never grow big enough to hire a CEO. Q. Is that why you say the entrepreneur must outsell their paycheck? The entrepreneur must be able to afford specialists if they want to grow? A. Exactly. When you look at the cash flow quadrant below, you can see the bigger picture. S quadrant entrepreneurs are entrepreneurs who work for money. For example, a person who owns a restaurant that sells hamburgers operates from the S quadrant. B quadrant entrepreneurs work to build assets that produce cash flow. Ray Kroc built a B quadrant hamburger business known as McDonald's. Q. So how do I learn to build a B quadrant business? A. You must build the framework, the outer triangle, of the BI triangle. You must have a strong mission, a great team, and be a leader who can inspire a team to follow you. Q. How do I learn those integrities? A. Military schools focus on these integrities. For example, my first day at the military academy I attended in New York we focused was the mission. At the academy, like in the Marine Corps, mission is everything. This is why I wrote 8 lessons in military leadership for entrepreneurs. This book explains how and why those with military training have the basics for becoming great entrepreneurs. Q. How does a person learn mission, team, and leadership skills without going to military school? A. Joining a network marketing company is a great way to build leadership skills, lead a team, and support a shared mission. The best thing about network marketing is that you learn to lead people without having to issue them paychecks. Most corporate leaders have the power of a paycheck. If you do not do what your boss tells you to do, there's a good chance you'll be fired. In network marketing, you have to learn to be an inspirational, mission-driven leader, some who can train people to be successful even without the short-term gratification of a paycheck. You are training people who can operate without a paycheck. If you can do that, you can do almost anything. Missionaries also step up to the challenges of mission, leadership, and team. My best friend was a Mormon missionary in Northern Ireland. His job was to convert Catholics to the Mormon religion. Today, he is an incredibly successful entrepreneur. You can also strengthen your integrities as a volunteer working in your church or for a charity, leading volunteers, people who work for free, and helping to grow your church or favorite charity. There are many ways you can gain real-life experience in mission, team, and leadership. I gained mine in military school and in the Marine Corps. For your second chance, you'll want to find the ways that works for you, so you can gain real-life leadership experience. Q. What happens if I am an entrepreneur, but don't really have a mission, or the leadership skills to build and inspire a team? A. Then odds are you will remain an entrepreneur in the S quadrant. There is nothing wrong with that, as long as you are happiest there. Just remember, S quadrant entrepreneurs often pay a higher tax rate than their employees. The entrepreneurs who pay the lowest tax rates are entrepreneurs in the B and I quadrants. The king of the jungle in the world of big cats there are leopards and lions. Leopards are similar to entrepreneurs in the S quadrant. Leopards are loners. They hunt by themselves and if they don't kill, they don't eat. The male lion has a pride. In the business world, that pride is a B-quadrant business, a team of specialists. The male lion does not hunt. The pride hunts. 
Once the pride has made a kill, the male lion walks over and enjoys the feast. This is not the most elegant example of the differences between an S quadrant entrepreneur and a B quadrant entrepreneur, but I believe you get the picture. If you want to learn more about what types of specialists make up a B quadrant business, you may want to read my Rich Dad Advisors books or listen to them on the Rich Dad Radio Show. Their wisdom will guide you into your future, if you want to be a generalist who leads specialists. Q. Why are people skills so important? A. People are like icebergs. When we first meet a person, we meet only the part of the iceberg that is above water. We do not see the 99% that is below the water line. People skills are required to deal effectively with the entire person. Q. How do I guide my children to the B and I quadrants? A. Donald Trump's two sons, Don Jr. and Eric, are good friends of mine. They were on Rich Dad Radio talking about how their dad is developing them to be leaders in the B and I quadrants. They are not two spoiled brats, as many children, rich and poor, are. And they are not specialists. They are generalists, bright young men and strong leaders with great people skills. They are being groomed to be leaders in the B and I quadrants. Lessons from Bucky Fuller I have heard Bucky say, what usually happens in the educational process is that the faculties are dulled, overloaded, stuffed and paralyzed so that by the time most people are mature they have lost their innate capabilities. During his talks he emphasized this point, over-specialization leads to extinction. One reason why so many people are going back to school is because technology has rendered them obsolete. Unfortunately, they go to school and learn to be specialists, rather than generalists. Fuller often used the example of the mighty dinosaur becoming extinct because dinosaurs were too specialized. They were not able to adapt to the changing environment. Today, book publishers, many of whom are my friends and business associates, are the dinosaurs. Amazon is the new publishing giant that is changing the environment for books. In October of last year I was with my Marine Corps squad in Pensacola. According to a few of the guys, rumor has it that all branches of the service are cutting back on the training of jet pilots. The prediction is that pilotless drones will replace human pilots, just as the Google self-driving car may replace taxi drivers and Uber drivers. More real-world example of the huge changes to skills, training, and jobs, and how technology continues to change our world. The smartest thing to do what is considered smart is changing. As I've said, when I was in school, all of my classmates wanted to climb the corporate ladder. Today, everyone wants to become an entrepreneur. Everyone has a million-dollar idea in their head. The problem is, schools do not teach people to be entrepreneurs. For your second chance, you need to decide what is best for you. Which quadrant is best for you? For many people, the smart thing to do is get a good job, save money, live debt-free, invest in the stock market and hope that money will be there when they need it. For some, clinging to financial security in the ENS quadrants is smart. For other people, the smart thing to do is become an entrepreneur. That often means being millions of dollars in debt debt used to acquire businesses and real estate that create a life of financial freedom in the B and I quadrants. Q. What is the difference between the E and S side of the quadrant and the B and I side of the quadrant? A. The difference lies in your choice of education and advisors. Q. What determines what's smart for me? What I should do? A. Your spirit tells you which path to follow. What inspires you? What challenges you? What path is best suited for your unique gifts and talents? Every time I thought about going to work in corporate America, my stomach turned. I became nauseous. There are people who feel that way every day when they think about their job or work day. When I think about being an entrepreneur, my spirit soars. I get happy even though I know being an entrepreneur is often a much harder road than working for a paycheck in corporate America. I did not want to be a specialist, a small entrepreneur in the S quadrant. Q, so S-quadrant entrepreneurs have to be the smartest ones on their team. 
and B quadrant entrepreneurs don't have to be the smartest person, they just need the smartest team. A, you got it. I've never been the smartest person on my team, and I never want to be. Rich Dad said, if you're the smartest person on your team, your team's in trouble. And if Rich Dad were alive today he would say, specialists always work for generalists. For example, I don't work for doctors, they work for me. That's one of the reasons why I wrote the book Why A Students Work for C Students. So what is smart for you? Your spirit knows your answer. Lesson for your second chance The opposite of job security is financial freedom. Job security requires specialized education. Financial freedom requires generalized education. Your task is to decide which is best for you, security or freedom. They are very different. In fact, they are opposites. The more security you seek, the less freedom you have. That's why all prisons have maximum security cells. Financial education is. The opposite side of the coin employees and the self-employed are specialists. Entrepreneurs are generalists. Chapter 13 The opposite of get out of debt The generalized principle of effortlization is the ability to do more with less. Our Buckminster Fuller most financial experts say, get out of debt. Live debt free. Don't they know that after 1971, when President Richard Nixon took the US dollar off the gold standard, the US dollar became debt? While living debt-free may be good advice for people without financial education, it is not smart financial advice. There are two kinds of debt in the world of money. They are, one good debt. Two bad debt. Simply put, good debt makes you richer and bad debt makes you poorer. Without financial education, it isn't surprising that millions of people, and the United States government, are buried under mountains of bad debt. The big spenders many people believe it was the Democrats that increased the national debt. But that isn't the story the charts tell. As I've stated in the opening pages of this book, I am not a Republican or a Democrat. And the research behind the cone of learning indicates, looking at a picture is better than listening to words, especially political speeches. The problem with this debt is that it's bad debt, debt the taxpayers and their children must pay. Much of the debt incurred by Republicans goes to the rich who control the military-industrial complex, banks, pharmaceutical companies and other corporations. Much of the debt accrued by Democrats goes to entitlement programs and corporations that profit from entitlement programs. Social Security and Medicare are generally not included in the national debt numbers, although they represent debt obligations much, much larger than the national debt. These two debts Social Security and Medicare are considered off-balance sheet debt. That would be like you owing a million dollars, but not reporting it on a credit application when you applied for a loan. If you and I did what our government does, we could be sent to jail. Nobody knows the exact number for Social Security and Medicare debt. Educated guesses put Social Security debt at $23 trillion and Medicare at $87 trillion. That's trillion, with a T. I have seen other estimates as high as $125 trillion. The U.S. national debt is a mere $17 trillion. Q, are you saying the United States is bankrupt? A. I could make a case to support that position. It wouldn't be hard. What is good debt? Good debt is simply debt that makes you richer. For example, when I buy an apartment complex, I use debt to finance the property. If the apartments puts money in my pocket every month, then my debt is good debt. If, on the other hand, my apartments lose money every month and I have to make the mortgage payment, that same debt becomes bad debt. Once again, it is cash flow that determines if something is good or bad debt. Q, is that why you say, your house is not an asset? For most homeowners, their house is taking money out of their pockets. A, yes. Even if your house is debt free, cash is still flowing out of your pocket for taxes, maintenance, insurance, and utilities. Leverage A very important word in the world of money is the word leverage. 
Leverage is similar to Fuller's word ephemeralization, which means the ability to do more with less. One of the primary reasons why the poor grow poorer and the middle class shrinks, is because they have little to no leverage. When the poor and middle class think about how to make more money, they think about working harder and longer. Unfortunately, when you work harder and longer, you may make more money but move into higher tax brackets. Financial education is leverage. One purpose of financial education is to give you leverage, the ability to ephemeralize, and be able to do more with less. Let me give you some examples of financial leverage, ways to do more with less. Debt as a professional, active investor in the I quadrant, I want to use as much debt as possible to acquire assets. The reason Kim and I own thousands of properties is not because we've been able to save money to buy them. We use debt to buy them. That is why that three-day real estate program was priceless for me. It taught me how to leverage debt. Licensing If you will take a look at the photo of the rich dad employees at the front of this book, you may notice that we are a very small company. Yet, via licensing, we are a very, very, large international business. When I write a book, that book is licensed to over 50 publishers throughout the world. These publishers pay the rich dad company a royalty for the right to publish my books and games. Social media Today's social media world offers huge leverage, if used properly. Today, at the rich dad offices, we have a tiny television and radio studio through which we stay in touch with millions of people all over the world. Brand Rich Dad is an international brand. Being a brand is huge leverage. A brand speaks louder than words and communicates two things, trust and differentiation. Examples of differentiation are found in our positioning. We don't say save money, our position is the opposite side of that coin. We do not recommend investing for the long term in stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. We believe the opposite, keep your money moving. And we do not place high value on job security. Instead, the Rich Dad brand stands for financial freedom. People employees have almost zero leverage because they are their employer's leverage. Entrepreneurship offers you the ability to leverage the time and efforts of others your employees to grow your business and your asset column. More with less delivering higher quality products or services for a lower price is another form of ephemeralization. When a person asks for a raise, charges more per hour, raises prices, or lowers quality to save money, they are working against the generalized principle of ephemeralization. They are doing less for more. The opposite of doing more with less. Debt as leverage when financial experts advise, get out of debt, they handicap people because they take away a lot of leverage. This type of advice is not financial education. Because without debt, a person is unable to do more with less. The following is a real life example of using debt as leverage. I will keep the numbers simple. In the 1980s, I purchased a two bedroom slash one bath house for $50,000. It was a cute house, in a good neighborhood, next to a park with a pond. The problem was the house was in need of repair. I put $5,000 down and the seller financed the balance, $45,000, at 10% interest. Seller financing means I didn't need a bank loan. My total monthly payments, PITI, principal, interest, taxes, and insurance, were about $450. Rents in the area were running at around $750 a month. Once I had tied the property up, I went to my banker and asked to borrow $5,000 for a home improvement loan. With that $5,000 loan, I added a large master bedroom with an adjoining bath, and fixed the rest of the house. I now had an almost new, three-bedroom slash two-bath house. The new rent was $1,000 a month. When interest rates started to go back down, I went back to the banker who loaned me the $5,000 and asked for a new loan this time on the entire house. The appraisal came in at $95,000. My banker gave me an 80% loan, $76,000 at 9% fixed for 10 years. I paid back the seller's $45,000 loan, 
the banker's $5,000 home improvement loan, and put approximately $25,000 in my pocket tax-free. My total PITI was approximately $700 a month. I set aside $100 a month for repairs and unexpected expenses. My tenant's payment of $1,000 a month put approximately $200 a month in net cash flow into my pocket each month. Q, so you had none of your own money in this investment? A, correct. That means my return was infinite. Q, infinite. Why is it infinite? A, because when ROI, or return on investment, is calculated the return is based upon how much equity or how much of the investor's money is in the investment. Since I had no money in equity none of my own money in the investment after the refinance the ROI was infinite. Q, so your real return is a result of your knowledge, your financial education? Without that you probably couldn't do these things, right? Find and finance investments that give you an infinite return? A, that's right. That is why one of our positioning statements for the Rich Dad Company is knowledge, the new money. Q, so you put $25,000, tax-free, into your pocket because the $25,000 is debt? A, yes. But if I had sold the property, the $25,000 would have been subject to capital gains tax, which for me, in my income tax bracket, would be 20%. Q. Okay, if you had sold the property, your net gain after taxes would have been $20,000. A, even less. Here's why, as long as I still owned the property I was earning approximately $200 a month in cash flow, an additional $2,400 a year in passive income, the lowest taxed of all incomes. Q, how many types of income are there? A, there are three basic types. Ordinary portfolio passive ordinary income is income from wages, interest on savings, and 401k savings programs. Ordinary income is taxed at the highest tax rates. Working for ordinary income is another reason the poor get poorer and middle class is shrinking. Portfolio income is also called capital gains, or income from selling something. People who flip houses, trade stocks, or sell businesses pay capital gains taxes, taxed at the second highest tax rate. Passive income is cash flow from assets. Since I do not sell the real estate properties I own choosing, instead, to borrow out my gains I realize and receive my capital gains via debt and passive income from rental income, the lowest taxed of all incomes. Now I can hear some of you saying, you can't do that. You cannot get seller financing. And you are right, if you say you can't, you can't. Q, so what about people who live outside the United States? Can they do this, too? A, sure they can. The terms and rules may be a little different, but the basic concepts are true all over the world. When I was first starting out, in 1973, my real estate instructor said everyone would say, you can't do that here. He said, People without financial education always say, you can't do that here even though people are doing it. Q, so why do people say, you can't do that here? A, because it's easy to say, you can't do that here. Lazy people always find it easier to say you can't do something rather than take classes, study, practice, make mistakes, fail a few times, and learn how you can do something, something others say you can't. Q, does this strategy only apply to real estate? Or can I do this with anything? A, you can do this with anything. Stocks and stock options are a particularly easy way to make money with nothing. The advantage real estate has over stocks is the power of long-term debt. Q, so debt is leverage. And if I don't know how to use debt I work harder and harder for less and less? A, yes. Let me give you one more example of how debt makes me richer. When the stock and real estate markets crashed in 2007, we did not buy stocks at low prices. Instead we bought hundreds of millions of dollars worth of real estate using debt. We could buy much more real estate than stocks, 
because we were using our bankers' money. Besides, bankers aren't likely to lend hundreds of millions of dollars to anyone who plans to buy stocks. In 2014, Ken McElroy, his partner Ross, Kim, and I refinanced nearly $100 million in debt, debt on our apartment houses purchased after the 2007 crash. The average interest rate on our apartment houses was 5%. The new debt on that $100 million is at approximately 3%. That means we received millions of dollars in capital gains back and an additional $2 million in cash flow due to the lowered interest rates. Q, where does the additional $2 million come from? A, the $2 million in cash flow comes from the savings, the difference between paying 5% interest on $100 million of debt and 3% interest. Q, and that is what Fuller calls the generalized principle of ephemeralization, the ability to do more with less. A. Yes. Q. And this doesn't apply only to real estate? A. Correct. There are examples of ephemeralization everywhere. It's safe to say that everyone who is rich has used some form of leverage to get rich. For example, when a musician cuts a record and sells a million records, that is ephemeralization. When someone develops an app and sells a million copies of their app, that's ephemeralization, that's another way of doing more with less. The advantage of real estate is the power of both debt and taxes. Q, so when a financial advisor advises me to get out of debt, they are taking away one way for me to leverage, to ephemeralize. To do more with less? A, yes. And while they may mean well, they do not provide financial education. Financial education should show you the other side of the coin, and teach you to use debt to become richer, not poorer. The law of compensation Q, but what if I make mistakes with debt? A, that is why you take real estate classes and practice, practice, practice. I've taken many classes and I love to practice. I'd rather practice than buy impulsively and lose money. In the world of money, there is a law known as the law of compensation. Q. What is the law of compensation? A. Simply put it means that the more you learn, and practice and slowly take on bigger challenges, the more your intelligence and experience grows and the more your compensation will grow. For example, when Kim was first learning to invest, her financial plan was to purchase two small houses a year, 20 houses in 10 years. In less than 18 months, she had bought her 20 houses. Today, she has thousands of properties, earning millions of dollars in cash flow each year. She is also hundreds of millions of dollars in debt. That is an example of the law of compensation. A word of caution I have gone to a number of real estate seminars where the instructor makes the process of finding a great property sound tough, risky, and time-consuming. At the end of the class they often say, rather than spending your time looking for properties, making mistakes, and being frustrated with tenants and repairs, just give us your money and we'll find, finance, purchase, and manage the property for you. I suggest you stay away from these types of instructors and organizations. They are not teachers. They are promoters. They are not any different from a mutual fund salesperson, a person who invites you to a free financial planning seminar, and then tells you the smart thing to do is for you to give them your money. Q, what's wrong with giving someone else your money? Why not let them do all the work? A, great question. And the answer may surprise you. When you turn your money over to someone else, the law of compensation does not work for you. You may remember from studying the cone of learning that the two most important lines the two most effective ways to learn are simulations and doing the real thing. If you truly want to be financially free, you must practice and do the real thing. Yourself. Q, but if I get my cash flow and tax advantages, what is wrong with someone else doing the investing for me? A, the problem is real estate. Real estate is not liquid. To be liquid means, you can buy or sell it quickly. Stocks and mutual funds are extremely liquid. You can buy and sell in seconds. With real estate, 
the opposite is true. If you make a mistake, it is a long, slow, expensive process to get rid of a bad property. Millions of homeowners and flippers have found out just how illiquid real estate can be. So if you are not willing to practice, 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 I suggest that you not invest in investment real estate. Remember that when a real estate instructor says, I will invest for you, you are still the person responsible for the monthly mortgage payments, problems with tenants, the expenses for maintenance and upkeep, and insurance not the instructor. Worst of all, you learn little to nothing. The law of compensation and leverage work against you. The reason you want to learn to use debt is because debt is today's money. Debt is the most powerful force in the world of money. The reason you want to take classes and practice is to learn to harness this most powerful of forces. If you are not willing to start small, learning how to use debt to invest in real estate, it is best you save money, live debt free, and invest for the long term in mutual funds. At least savings and mutual funds are liquid. Lesson from Bucky Fuller Bucky Fuller said, don't fight forces, use them. The reason I included the chart on the US presidents and debt at the beginning of this chapter is because if things do not change, debt will bring down the United States, a country that was once the richest country in the world. Debt will enslave our children and their children's children. Traditional education teaches people to live debt free. And while you may choose to be personally debt free, our leaders are putting the future of our world in debt. If you do not want to be a slave to government debt, fight fire with fire. Learn to use the forces of personal debt to counter the incompetence of our leaders. Lesson for your second chance if you plan to live a debt free life, what other type of leverage do you plan to use? How will you ephemeralize your life? How do you plan on doing more with less? If you fail to learn to use some type of leverage, you will work hard all your life and still end up poor. If you want to learn to harness the power of debt, play cash flow and use every opportunity to get into debt, rather than get out of debt. When you play games, you can lose the game but still learn a lot financial education is. The opposite side of the coin bad debt makes the poor and middle class poorer. Bad debt is debt you pay for yourself. Good debt makes the rich richer. Good debt is debt someone else pays off for you. Financial education is learning how to harness the power of debt, because today, debt is money. Chapter 14 The opposite of live below your means God wants all of us to be rich. Our Buckminster Fuller most financial experts recommend that you live below your means. The question is, do you want to live below your means? Obviously, most people do not like living below their means. That is why so many people are in credit card debt, living paycheck to paycheck, living in houses and driving cars they cannot afford, and going on vacations just to get away from their jobs, bills, fears, and financial problems. The irony is that most of the people that look rich are poorer than most poor people. Many poor people do not carry the consumer debt the middle class can afford. The middle class is deep in consumer debt just to keep up with the Joneses. I can't tell you how often I meet people who drive a Mercedes and live in nice neighborhoods, have kids in private schools, but are two paychecks away from bankruptcy. Since most people do not want to live below their means, that advice often falls on deaf ears. Instead, I recommend the opposite. Rather than live below your means, a person should learn to expand their means, so they can enjoy a richer life. Q. How does a person expand their means? A. A person expands their means by taking control of their asset column. Currently, grunge is in control of most people's asset columns. This is why most people are taught to save money, buy a house, and invest for the long term in the stock market. The game of money I've said it before, a picture is worth a thousand words. Pictured below are the differences between the rich, poor, and middle class. As you can tell, each of the three groups is playing a completely different game of money. Change your game Your second chance begins when you change your game. Rather than work hard to save money, or work hard to look rich, simply change your focus from your income column to your asset column. 
why let grunge control your asset column? Why follow the advice of financial experts and mindlessly turn your money over to grunge? The asset column is where the rich play their game of money. Why not you? How to pay less in taxes The first thing that happens when you focus on your asset column is that your taxes start to go down. For example, when you start your own home-based business many expenses that were personal, after-tax expenses immediately become pre-tax business expenses. If you have a business, many expenses such as some travel, hotel, and meals can be tax-deductible business expenses. Obviously you need to check with a qualified tax advisor or your CPA before claiming any deductions. The lesson is, by shifting focus to the asset column, the focal point of the rich, you begin to enjoy some of the tax benefits they enjoy. I wish I had a Ferrari recently, I drove up to a property Kim and I own, and parked my Ferrari. Three young construction workers, sweating in the hot Arizona sun, stopped working to admire my car. One smiled and said, I wish I could afford a Ferrari. You can, I replied. No, we can't, another young man replied. We did not go to college. We came from poor families, so we could not afford to go to college. That is why we are laborers. I asked if I could show them how they could afford a Ferrari, even if they didn't go to college. All three said, yes. To explain, I drew the following diagram on a piece of paper. Pointing to my apartment building where they were working, I said, this property is paying for my Ferrari. This property is also paying for you and the work you do to improve my property. As they began to understand the difference between assets and liabilities, I explained Rich Dad's lesson the rich don't work for money and how the rich work, instead, for assets that produce cash flow. Didn't you go to college to learn to do that, one of them asked. No, I replied, and explained that I learned how to do what I do by taking a three-day seminar for $385 when I was about their age. When they understood I was only playing Monopoly in real life, and that the apartment complex where they were working was a red hotel, the lights in their heads went on. So we can do the same thing, they asked. Why not? I asked. If I can do it, so can you. It is not rocket science. I then went on to explain that my assets buy my liabilities. I also explained that most people struggle financially because they buy liabilities that they believe are assets. So you expand your means, rather than live below your means, one man asked. Correct, I replied. Inside each of you is a rich person, a poor person, and a middle class person. By choosing to focus on your asset column, then learning more and more about assets, the rich person in you comes out. I went on to explain that the word education is derived from the Greek word edus, which means to draw out. Traditional education is designed to draw out the middle class person in people. It takes financial education to draw out the rich person in them. And financial education is opposite from traditional education. Yes, I replied. Is real estate the only kind of asset? No, I replied, and went on to explain that J.K. Rowling was on welfare when she wrote the Harry Potter books. Her books and movies made her a billionaire. I told them about an acquaintance of mine who never finished high school, but is a millionaire today, selling eggs. In high school, his grandmother gave him a few chickens. He was soon breeding chickens and selling their eggs. Today, at the age of 50, he sells over a million eggs a day. I reminded them of Colonel Sanders, who had only a chicken recipe, which he turned into the Kentucky Fried Chicken Empire. And they'd all heard of Mark Zuckerberg, a guy their age who never finished school, but who created Facebook. I stressed that I was making this sound simple, but that it isn't easy. So if we focus on our asset column, we can expand our means, make more money from cash flow rather than a paycheck, and pay less in taxes. Is that what you're saying? Correct, I replied. And on top of that you will be able to drive any car you want and let your assets pay for the car. As I drove off, I could see them talking excitedly. 
I haven't seen them since so I do not know what happened after our discussion. At least I knew they understood that they did not have to live below their means. Not if they didn't want to. All they had to do was take control of their asset column. Lesson from Bucky Fuller People often ask, how did Fuller survive after he stopped working for money in 1927? I explained that Bucky did the same things Rich Dad taught his son and me to do. Rather than work for money, Fuller began creating assets in his asset column. Rather than real property, most of his assets were intellectual property. Intellectual property is invisible assets such as patents, books, licenses, and trademarks. I own many of the same kinds of assets. This book is one of them. As soon as it was completed, it was licensed to book publishers all over the world. Lesson for your second chance first, make a list of all the good things in life you want. Call it your wish list. For years, Kim and I would drive by the house we now live in and say, someday that house will be ours. Today, it is. The difference is, first we bought rental properties that, today, pay the monthly mortgage on our dream house. Second, make a list of the different assets you want to acquire, assets that will pay for the dreams of your life. Do not worry if you do not yet know how to acquire those assets. Admitting you don't know something is how learning begins. People who know everything, learn nothing. Third, look at this list every day. Financial education is. The opposite side of the coin expanding your means and living below your means are two sides of the same coin, two points of view on how you approach life. Conventional wisdom most often supports living below your means, but we all have the choice the chance to live a richer life and that starts with focusing on your asset column and expanding your means. Chapter 16 The opposite of the rich are greedy are you spontaneously enthusiastic about everyone having everything you can have? Our Buckminster Fuller many people believe the rich are greedy. And some are. Many people believe the only way a person can become rich is by being greedy. And many rich people do get rich by being greedy. Rich Dad often said, it is not how much money a person makes that disturbs people. It is how they make their money. For example, when a star football player makes millions, most people are okay with the fact that they're rich. They have worked hard for years starting as kids with a dream, practicing for years for free, then turning pro and making millions of dollars by making millions of sports fans happy. Few people think they are greedy. Millions of adoring fans are happy they are rich. The same is true with movie stars who make millions. Most people are not upset that they make lots of money. Tom Hanks and Sandra Bullock make millions because millions of people love watching them. And when I was a kid, I was happy the Beatles made millions selling millions of records. Their music made me very happy. But when a rich employer, intentionally, pays their employees peanuts, most people get upset. My point is that when people get rich by being cheap, cruel, dishonest, criminal, unethical, or immoral, honest people become upset. High blood pressure My blood pressure goes up every time I think about the bankers that caused the crash of 2007 being paid bonuses, even though millions lost their jobs, their homes, and their futures. Corrupt politicians who use their power to make themselves and their friends richer. CEOs who are paid millions running their companies into the ground. Their incompetence costs their employees their jobs and their shareholders their money. The Fed, Wall Street, and the US government, pumping trillions of counterfeit dollars into the big banks, protecting their rich friends at the expense of the poor, the middle class, and future generations to come. Government public servant unions, stealing from the people they are supposed to be serving, via bonuses and pensions. Many public servants retire earning much more than military veterans who risk their lives serving their country. Recent examples that I am aware of include, a City of Phoenix librarian who retired at age 58 and was paid a bonus of $286,000 and an annual pension over $102,000 for the rest of her life. Three Phoenix firefighters who, in 2011, received over $1 million each plus their pensions when they retired. 
a report that the top 50 government retirees in Phoenix will receive, collectively, $183 million, from taxpayer dollars, by the time they reach age 75. Many people in Phoenix are upset. They think these government employees are greedy. Millions of dollars are going to a few people, rather a more broad distribution. Consider, for a moment, another point of view, the public servants think they are generous. They've dedicated their lives to public service. What do you think? These same payouts are going on in most states and cities in America. All of the examples above are symptoms of extreme greed and corruption. The great cash heist is on. Greed seems to be taking over the world. Get rich by being generous on the opposite side of the coin, many people become rich by being generous. Walt Disney became very rich by making millions of people happy. And Henry Ford became very rich by making the automobile affordable for the working class. Sergey Brin of Google is a billionaire because he made access to information easier than going to the local library. Learning to be rich and generous if you read Rich Dad Poor Dad, you may recall that my poor dad became very angry with my rich dad because my rich dad did not pay his son and me. He wanted us to work for free. In exchange for our time, rich dad taught his son and me to be rich by being generous. Our lessons began by playing Monopoly for hours. Most of us know the formula for wealth from the game of Monopoly. Very simply, the formula is four green houses, converted to one red hotel. Today, Kim and I play Monopoly in real life. We have thousands of little green houses, also known as apartments, two hotels, five golf courses, commercial buildings, several businesses, and many oil wells. We also share our knowledge by writing our books and creating financial education games. Some people would say we are greedy. We think we are generous. Many of the people who accuse the rich of being greedy often have only one house. Their balance sheet looks like this, who do you think is greedy? Employee or entrepreneur? Kim and I are responsible, both directly and indirectly, for thousands of jobs via our worldwide businesses and investments. For example, our Red Hotel a large Phoenix resort employs more than 800 people. Think about the millions in tax dollars generated by those 800 employees. Think about all the other businesses, stores, restaurants, doctors, dentists, and families that the income from those 800 employees touch. This is why I become testy when I hear people categorically say, the rich are greedy. I believe that it's the lack of financial education in our schools that causes people to become greedy. When people have money but no assets, they become greedy, desperate, and needy. Q, are you saying the people who call the rich greedy, are themselves even greedier than the rich? A, yes and no. I am saying your point of view depends on which side of the coin you're on. My poor dad saw my rich dad as greedy. My rich dad saw my poor dad as greedy. In my eyes, both were very generous men. Your job is to stand on the edge of the coin to determine what is true for you. Your second chance begins with your definition of what is generous and what is greedy. Q. Why did your rich dad see your poor dad as greedy? A. My poor dad believed in taking from the rich and giving to the poor. My poor dad thought the rich should pay higher wages and be subject to higher taxes rates. Q. Your poor dad was a socialist? A. You could say that. He was a good man who believed in helping people. Q, and your rich dad was a capitalist. A, that's a fair assessment. He, too, was a good man who believed in helping people. Q, how can you say the same thing about both men? A, because it's true. Both were good men who believed in helping people. Their views on how to help people were opposite. Lesson from Bucky Fuller Bucky Fuller made many predictions and many have come true. His predictions that have not yet come true require more time and advances in technology. Two predictions that have haunted me are, he predicted that humans born after 1945, and who did not smoke, had a life expectancy of 140 years. 
he made his prediction based upon the accelerating acceleration in medical technology. He predicted unemployment would increase as computers replaced humans. He said, man is going to be displaced altogether as a specialist by the computer. Man himself is being forced to re-establish, employ, and enjoy his innate comprehensivity. Decades ago, in the 60s and 70s, he was predicting that unemployment would increase with advances in technology. He said the idea of earning a living would become an obsolete idea. We must do away with the absolutely specious notion that everybody has to earn a living. Fuller also said, we find all the no-life support wealth producing people going to their 1980 jobs in their cars or buses, spending trillions of dollars worth of petroleum daily to get to their no-wealth producing jobs. It doesn't take a computer to tell you that it will save both universe and humanity trillions of dollars a day to pay them handsomely to stay at home. In 2014, as entitlement programs grow and young graduates are unable to find jobs, I can hear Fuller saying to our class in 1983, in the future, it will make more sense to pay people to stay at home. In 1983, that idea was outside my reality. Q, so what's your concern? A, Fuller's predictions are coming true. Today, even low-wage countries such as China, are realizing the challenges of mass unemployment. Today in China there are thousands of factories sitting idle. My concern is, what will happen if billions of people are unemployed and live past 100? Q, that could never happen, could it? A, that is exactly what I thought back in 1983. Today, I am less certain. What would happen to China, the United States, and the world, if hundreds of millions were out of work and governments went bust, attempting to pay them to stay at home? That thought disturbs me. In 1983, Fuller told our class that it would be our generation that would be faced with those problems in the future. My concern is that the future is here today. Q, what did he mean when he said, man himself is being forced to re-establish, employ, and enjoy his innate comprehensivity? A, he believed most people would be happy to be paid to stay at home. It would be good for our environment if fewer people were stuck in traffic driving to and from work, only to do jobs that did not make our world a better place. By comprehensivity, he meant a few humans, paid to stay at home, would be inspired to do their spirit's work and fulfill their God-given life's purpose. He said millions would do things that he referred to as spontaneously arousable and people would begin to solve our planet's problems, not for a paycheck, but because they wanted to solve the problem. Q, is that what you did? A, yes. After reading Grunch in 1983, I knew what I had to do. Q, and what was that? A, I knew I had to do what George Orwell stated in his book, 1984, in a time of universal deceit, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. And, coincidentally, in 1984 Kim and I took our leap of faith. Q, and what are your solutions? A, education needs to change. We can no longer say to people, go to school and get a job. We must train people to be entrepreneurs, not employees. The world needs entrepreneurs who will create jobs and work to solve world problems, rather than work just to make money. The good news is, today, millions of people are becoming entrepreneurs. The problem is most are becoming entrepreneurs in the S quadrant, continuing to work for money. The world needs more B-quadrant entrepreneurs who create assets that produce cash flow. Assets that don't just make money, but assets that change the world. Q, so are you asking me to ask myself, what would I do if I did not have to earn a living? What gift would I give if I never needed a paycheck again? Is that what you are asking me? A, yes. Those are the questions I asked myself in 1983. Lesson for your second chance ask yourself that question, if I never had to work for money again, what would I do? Then ask yourself, would I be greedy or generous with my knowledge and my life? They're two sides of the same coin. Financial education is. The opposite side of the coin you can choose to hoard your knowledge, 
be greedy with what you have and what you know. Or share it. Financial education is about generosity, not greed. Chapter 17 The opposite of investing is risky I have spent most of my life on learning things that were proved not to be true. R. Buckminster Fuller Most people believe investing is risky. And for most people investing is risky. Grunch wants you to believe that investing is risky. Q. Why would Grunch want you to believe that? A. So you'll turn your money over to them. Q. That's why you think there's no financial education in schools, isn't it? A. It seems that way to me. That's why most teachers advise students to save money and invest for the long term in the stock market. That advice sends your money directly into the pockets of Grunch. Q. Are you saying that's bad? A. No. Because, again, there are always at least two sides to everything. Some people believe investing is risky and others do not. The question is, what do you believe? What do you want to believe? As Fuller said, I have spent most of my life on learning things that were proved not to be true. Q. But isn't what you do risky? A. Yes, there is risk, but there is risk in everything. Did you fall down learning to walk? Q. Sure. A. Today, can you now walk without falling? Q. Of course. A. Well the same is true with investing. Do you drive a car? Q. Yes, I drive a car. A. How did you learn to drive a car? Q. My father taught me. A. Did his guidance decrease or increase your risks in driving a car? Q. It decreased the risk. Okay. I get your point. A. Do you understand why I invested in a three-day seminar on real estate investing and spent 90 days practicing looking for investments before I invested my money? Q. So you could reduce your risk? A. And increase my rewards. Today, that three-day course and the 90 days of practice have made me a multimillionaire. But more importantly, it reduced my financial risks and increased my rewards, rewards such as never needing a job, never worrying about the ups and downs of the stock market. Education and practice have given me the freedom to make as much money as I want without working and I've been able enjoy life more without the fear and worry of keeping my boss happy and not getting fired. Q. So the opposite of risk is reward? A. That is one opposite. For me, the opposite side to risk is control. Risk plus control equals rewards. Learning to fly, in 1969, I reported to Pensacola, Florida to learn to fly. It was an exhilarating, exciting, and expanding educational process. I walked in a caterpillar and two years later flew out as a butterfly. It was beyond educational. It was transformational. The same thing happened for me years later when I sat down in the three-day real estate seminar. I walked in a poor man, and two years later I was a rich man. I never needed a job or paycheck again. Examples of controls I learned a lot about risk, reward, and controls flying in Vietnam. Many of those controls I still use today as an investor. Some of those controls are, one control over my education, as pilots we were always in school. We never stopped learning. Learning and living went hand in hand. The more we learn the more our chances of survival increased. Two control over my advisors, my teachers in flight school were real pilots. Most people are in financial trouble because they take financial advice from salespeople, not rich people. Three control over my time, most people are so busy working they have no time to get rich. Q. Can you give me an example of how taking control of education, advisors, and time can reduce my risks and increase my rewards? A. Sure. Let's say I invest $10,000 in shares of Exxon. I receive no guarantee of a return. But if I invest $10,000 in an oil well, the government guarantees me a $3,200 return via a tax deduction. Q. A guaranteed 32% return? Can anyone do that? Get that tax credit? A. Sure. 
anyone can invest in the same kinds of investments. Again, it all comes back to the three controls. You must control your education, your advisors, and your time. If you would like to learn more about how this 32% tax deduction works, listen to the Rich Dad radio show on the subject with special guest Mike Mosley. As you listen to the program, notice how the three controls education, advisors, and time can reduce your risks and increase your returns. The power of trust, on every US dollar are the words in God we trust. In my opinion, these words are fraudulent. I doubt that God trusts the US dollar. Wall Street bankers who work for Grunch often say, gold is a barbaric relic of the past. Of course they would say that. Gold is their competition. They do not like gold, because they cannot print gold. On the other side of the coin, there is some truth to gold being a barbaric metal. Other than ornamental jewelry, gold has very little value. Silver, on the other hand, has much more value than gold. Silver is a precious metal as well as an industrial metal. Gold is hoarded and silver is consumed. To me, this makes silver more valuable than gold. Q. If gold has very little value, why did God create gold? Why have humans covet, hoard, kill, and conquer entire nations, for gold? A. The answer is found in the word trust. Gold is trustworthy. Gold is rare, an element that cannot be counterfeited. In his latest book, Money, released in 2014, Steve Forbes, CEO of the Forbes Media Empire, is calling for a return to the gold standard. In his book, Steve states three important reasons why the world needs to go back on the gold standard. They are, paper money is not wealth. If the United States had remained on the gold standard, incomes today would be 50% higher. The gold standard will increase trust. Gold allows strangers to trade, to do business with one another with confidence. When people do not trust the money they are using, trade decreases and economies contract. In other words, when governments print money, trust amongst people and nations goes down, trade goes down, and when trade goes down, economies contract. When economies contract, honest people suffer, and often become desperate people. That desperation can lead to increases in crime, violence, immorality, and terrorism. Reducing the risk, when trust is low, risk goes up. The more money the government prints, the more our trust in it will go down and risk goes up. Today, billions of people are nervous about the future. The way you begin to reduce your risks is by increasing the trust in yourself, via your education, advisors, and your time. Q. How do I start building trust in myself? A. Again, it begins with words. You build trust in yourself by learning the language of money, a language that's not taught in schools. The language of money in 2009, the former first vice president of Peru, Raul Diaz Canseco Terry invited Kim and me to visit his spectacular country, the private educational system he founded, and his home in Lima. Raul is an educational entrepreneur. The school system he founded begins with kindergarten and goes through college. It is an innovative system, preparing students for the real world of commerce. Obviously, Machu Picchu was on our itinerary. While looking over this magnificent civilization on top of the Andes, I asked Romero, one of the Inca scholars, in our party, what separated those that lived at the highest levels from those that lived at the lower levels. Without hesitation, he replied, language. Those who lived at the highest levels spoke Quechua, the language of commerce. Romero explained it was Quechua that empowered the Inca Empire to dominate the west coast of South America. Today, in the modern world, not much has changed. The richest people speak the language of commerce, the language of money, a language not taught in schools. The difference between my rich dad and my poor dad were the words they spoke. While both spoke English they did not speak the same language. If you learn a few new words every month, your trust in yourself will go up, risks will go down, and rewards will go up. Q. 
Would you give me an example of words that will make me richer? A. Sure. You already know that assets put money in your pocket and liabilities take money from your pocket. Other words that are important are cash flow versus capital gains. The poor and middle class invest for capital gains. They buy, hold, and pray that prices will go up. Real estate flippers invest for capital gains. That is why they think investing is risky. They have no control over whether the price goes or down. They see very little cash flow. And when they sell and make a profit, they pay capital gains taxes, the second highest of all taxes. Q. So the rich invest for cash flow? A. The rich on the BNI side of the quadrant invest for many things. They invest for cash flow, capital gains, control, and tax advantages. Q. How do I learn to do that? A. Change your education, your advisors, and what you do with your time. If you do that, you'll find that the words you use will change. You'll learn more about how the rich on the BNI side of the quadrant invest capital gains, cash flow, and reduce taxes in the next chapter. Q. And what are some of the differences between S quadrant entrepreneurs and B quadrant entrepreneurs? A. S quadrant entrepreneurs work for money by providing products or services. Q. Aren't they assets? A. No, not in most cases. A true asset produces cash flow. Products and services produce money. Q. Can you explain that in more detail, in simpler terms? A. Sure. And I want you to notice the differences in words. Let's say that an entrepreneur opens a restaurant. The entrepreneur provides great food and great service. The food is the product and the employees provide the service. The next day, the process starts all over again. Everyone is working for ordinary income, paychecks, and tips. Ordinary income is the highest taxed income. When you work for money, save money, and invest in a 401k, your income is taxed at ordinary income tax rates. If I am a B-quadrant real estate entrepreneur, an investor who owns the building the restaurant is in, I have provided an asset. I have used debt to acquire the building, and I receive passive income, the least taxed income. On top of this, I pay less and less in taxes due to depreciation, amortization, and appreciation, all different types of income. Q. Depreciation, amortization, and appreciation are different types of income? A. Yes. If you do not understand the differences in the words, talk to a tax accountant or tax attorney, or read Tom Wheelwright's book Tax-Free Wealth. The lesson in this chapter is about risk, the importance of words, and how words can reduce risk. You may want to listen to shows with Tom on Rich Dad Radio. Q. So the S quadrant entrepreneur works harder and harder, takes all the risks, and pays more in taxes. The B quadrant entrepreneur works less, makes more money, and pays less in taxes? A. Yes. The point is the differences in words and that individuals in different quadrants use different words. I'll share this story again, but in a different context. In Rich Dad Poor Dad I wrote about Ray Kroc, founder of McDonald's saying, I am not in the hamburger business. I am in the real estate business. In other words, McDonald's hamburgers and french fries, their products and services, pay for the real estate, the real asset. This is why McDonald's is one of the biggest real estate companies in the world. Simply said, the poor and middle class use the words of the E and S quadrants. The rich use the words of the B and I quadrants, the language of money, the language the ink is called Quechua. Rich Dad often said, words have the power to make you rich or poor. If you want to be rich, learn the words that will make you rich. The best news is, words are free. Lesson from Bucky Fuller in Grunge of Giants, Fuller wrote, Corporations are neither physical nor metaphysical phenomena. They are socio-economic ploys legally enacted game playing agreed upon only between overwhelmingly powerful socio-economic individuals and by them imposed upon human society and its all unwitting members. Q. What does he mean? A. I believe he was saying that it's risky to trust grunge, 
the invisible power behind our world's biggest banks and corporations. To me he is saying it is risky to trust your personal asset column to grunge. If you insist on investing in paper assets, do not invest for the long term. Instead, take classes on how to invest in stock options, and learn how to make money when markets are going up or down. On the other side of the coin, if you want to reduce your risks and be rich, you may want to learn the language of grunge, the language of the B and I quadrants. Reducing risk in the stock market If your investments are in the stock market, you may want to listen to Rich Dad advisor Andy Tanner on Rich Dad Radio. Andy has a gift for using humor to make his points. For example, in a radio segment when he was our guest for the hour, he said, if you are taking a cruise on the Titanic, the first thing you want to do is count the number of lifeboats. Investing one hour of your time, listening to Andy Tanner is a great way to start your second chance. Lesson for your second chance, many financial experts say, to achieve higher returns requires higher risk. Q, why do they say that if it's not true? A, who knows? That person could be a liar, a con man, or just an idiot. Most probably, he is just repeating what he has been told to say. He has not done what Fuller recommends, I have spent most of my life on learning things that were proved not to be true. Today, millions of Americans, through their 401, K, S and IRAs, blindly turn their money over to people they do not know or trust. They follow the instructions of parrots, repeating what they have been told to say. That's a risky proposition. Financial education is. Opposite side of the coin The opposite of risk is control. For your second chance in life, take back control of your education, your advisors, and your time. Chapter 19 The opposite of an emergency is bad The things to do are, the things that need doing, that you see need to be done, and that no one else seems to see need to be done. Our Buckminster Fuller as you know, our world faces many challenges, many much bigger than a financial crisis. Many people ask, what is our government going to do about it? And I believe that is a major part of our crisis, too many people expecting our government to solve our problems. Too many people are dependent upon the government for a paycheck. Fuller did not care much for politics. He said, my ideas have undergone a process of emergence by emergency. When they are needed badly enough, they are accepted. He also said that we had a choice of creating heaven or hell on earth. He warned that our generation, not his, would face the biggest crisis of all a crisis marking the end of the industrial age and the beginning of the information age. His forecast was accurate. Today we are all in a giant, global state of emergency. The good news is that Fuller often spoke on the generalized principle of emergence through emergency. He explained that out of all emergencies, something new and better emerges. He used the example of an unborn chick, still in its shell, panicking as it grows larger, trapped in a tight little shell, with food, air, space, and life support running out. Just when things look the darkest, the chick breaks through its shell and emerges into a whole new world. Fuller was concerned about whether or not humans would choose to create heaven on earth or choose oblivion as we evolved into the future. He warned us not to be complacent, not to let our politicians determine humanity's future. He warned that the old guard that controlled power would fight to hold on to that power. Our challenge as we enter this global emergency is, who determines our future? I will leave you with these thoughts for your second chance and your future. Steve Jobs said, you can't connect the dots looking forward, you can only connect them looking backwards. So you have to trust that the dots will somehow connect in your future. To begin your second chance, take some time and look backwards. Then connect the dots and ask yourself, what in my past is pointing to my future? When I asked myself that question, I realized my future began when I raised my hand, in the fourth grade, and asked, when are we going to learn about money? In that same speech, Steve Jobs offered the best advice for these times, stay hungry. Stay foolish. In 1984, Kim and I did something really foolish. 
We took a leap into the unknown, looking for answers to the same question I had asked decades earlier, why don't we learn about money in school? In 1984, Kim and I were very hungry and very foolish. And Steve Jobs is correct. Being hungry and foolish has been a good thing. If we had not taken our leap of faith into the unknown, we would never have become friends with John Denver, spent an hour with Oprah Winfrey on her television show, co-authored books with Donald Trump, gotten to know Steve Forbes, been granted audiences with world leaders like Shimon Peres, President of Israel, and, most importantly, traveled the world to meet millions of great people like you. It's been great being hungry and foolish and I have no plans to change the way I operate. There are a number of questions I would like you to ask yourself, if I connect the dots of my past, where is my future going? When I was a kid, what questions did I want answered? What do I see that needs to be done and that no one else is doing? This is a very important question. Because if you do what needs to be done, without being told how to do it, your true genius will emerge. What cause am I willing to be hungry and foolish for? How much good is my work doing for the world? That question pushed me over the edge. When I stepped back and looked at my rock and roll business, the answer to that question was, not much. I was working hard, making money, but not doing much for the world. When I realized that I was working hard providing jobs, making money, but not doing much for the world I knew my days in the rock and roll business were numbered. I loved my work, but I knew that working only because I loved what I was doing was greedy. Not long after I committed to my leap of faith and resigned from my company, I met Kim. I doubt I would have met her if I were wishy-washy and indecisive about my future. In my heart, I believe God sent her to me, because God knew I as going to need help. Thanks and good luck.